Welcome to Church of the Chair, where we celebrate all the things we do while seated. I'm your host, E, here today with my co-host, Chad Lutzke, and we are working on a collaborative novel uh, tentatively entitled Planet Caravan. Uh, the whole point of this is to show our collaborative process in case people are interested, confused, in, you know, intrigued by how this whole thing goes down. Um, also, uh, it is for anybody who wants to just hang out and write with us or do your own creative projects, whatever that might be, or if you just need something to keep yourself busy while you're at work today. <laughs> Anyways, um, so uh, what I'm going to be doing today is I'm just going to, I'm jumping right back into it, um, right back into writing. Uh, I got another scene I want to do, and then Chad, I believe, is still going to be working on layering and building off of what i've already put up there which is kind of the routine we've fallen into so far um and uh while i do want to express this for anybody who's who might be looking at what chad's doing or seeing how much things are changing this is a completely that i love this process um it's almost like working with an editor in real time um and it's not affecting my momentum whereas if i was editing myself going along it would affect my momentum because i would be going back getting stuck on certain things and being shit being like shit i now i don't even want to write the rest of it because i got to fix this part but with chad doing that behind me i'm finding no problem continuing on um i'm also finding this a very unique situation because i know what's going i know it's going to happen for the most part and i'm still having a hell of a lot of fun um, I am not a plotter in any way, shape, or form. I usually hate the process. Once I get done outlining and plotting everything, no matter how thin that outline is, I always end up going, well, I know the story. This is no longer fun. Let me move on to something else. Good morning. Good morning, Joe. Let's get this bread. Yo! Anywho. Uh, but I also want to let Chad write his own stuff. So that's Oh, I've, thing. there's plenty in there. It, this, is, this is true. I feel, like I said, I figured uh, we were talking about this yesterday. Um, uh, when we get to the carnival, uh, I was telling Chad, for those of you who missed it yesterday, I was telling Chad, uh, Chad was worried that, you know, we needed to come together so that the carnival stuff, you know, that we plotted it properly. Um, so we weren't like, I don't know, double doing scenes or whatever. But I thought it was I thought the chaos would be good just having, you know, him write a scene where he goes and does this. And then I write a scene where he goes and does this, you know, di different scenes showcasing the uh, the theme of, you know, freedom and acceptance and all that, how he can, he has free reign to go and do what he wants to after coming from a very insular life, both with his mother in a good scenario. Uh, he didn't get out much, that kind of thing. They were still kind of on the poor end and then going and living with the, uh, the cracked out uncle, the Charleses, um, going and living with them. And once again, having that very insular experience, going from that kind of uh, constricted environment to wide open, you know, even so much so that, you know, he's allowed to get himself in trouble. You know, he's going he's going to do things that might upset someone, maybe the Ferris wheel man that we're going to use as an antagonist inside the carnival, whatever it might be. You know, he's allowed to do these things where he wasn't allowed before. So it's a whole, literally a whole new world for him. Um, and I, I I think it would be cool to see him just go off and do little stuff um, where even even when, you know, the other author doesn't know what's what's going to happen. It's going to be um, interesting when we have, when one of us is doing that and we have to come back and say, okay, there's a character here that's becoming a big, big deal. You know, yeah. like, you, yes. you never know. I've, yeah, I've written exactly. characters where it was supposed to just be some kind of like funny little thing, and the next thing you know, they're the sidekick through the whole, right through the whole rest of the book. Yeah, you you never know, man. It's a uh, it it happens quite it happens a lot. Now that, I, that now I'm thinking about it, uh, I can I can name at least five books right now that I've written where that happens, um, where a character comes in and you just let that character be who they are, and all of a sudden you have almost a second main character. You know, mm -hmm. and or, or that character becomes the uh, the fan favorite, as it were. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's it's, it's going to be great. So and that's another reason why it's like just let it, you know just go off on our own and see what kind of shenanigans happens, and then we can meet back. You know, when the when we've meandered enough and had enough fun, you know, building up everybody in the carnival through showing, not telling, kind of thing. Uh, 
you know, then we meet back to get back onto the plot. Um, I'm, I'm interested in how it goes anyways, whether or not it's going to work or not. I don't know, but I do love that theme. I do love that structure. Uh, the uh, very constricted environment going into a super open environment and the, not only the fish out of water stuff, but just the, the feeling of finally having that freedom. So, yeah. Uh, it's almost like, uh, what was it? I think uh, Caroline, the movie, how the real world is very dull and drab and muted colors, very monochrome, um, that kind of thing. And then when Coraline ends up going to the other world, everything is so bright and beautiful. Um, but that's the, that's the, you know, that's the scary world. That's where the other mother is. And, you know, the, but it is, and I'm not saying that's what we're doing here, but that's kind of like the same theme, you know, also Wizard of Oz, you know, going from the very plain world that Dorothy knows, the mm -hmm. sepia toned environment to this wonderful wacky world of Oz that is so bright and colorful. I really like stuff like that, where you take someone from inexperience into all new experiences. <clears throat> and I think that's another draw of the whole carnival story is it's not something, I mean, we, we all have a, it's a, there's a mystique to it and we all have an idea of how, you know, what a carnival is. It's just a traveling show comes in, provides entertainment and leaves. But to the people that live that lifestyle, like the, the old school, the, the ones who just stay there and make a career out of it, it is literally another world. They have their own uh, justice system. They have their own. It, it's almost like an indigenous tribe. Um, and that's, I, you know, it, it's an outsider thing. Um, and unfortunately, over the years, carnies um, have gotten the reputation of being not just the outcast, but being like criminals and, you know, deviants and all that stuff. And that's they go to the carnivals to to hide and, you know, seek out their victims when in all actuality, it's half true because, you know, most most of the time it is a situation where it's the only job that they can get. But it's usually not crimes that, you know, really might be stealing or drugs or whatever. It's it's not <clears throat> I don't want to say victimless, victimless, victimless crime, but uh, because robbery. But uh, what they do, they end up with the carnivals because the people working running the carnivals either believe in second chances because they were there themselves or second, third, fourth, fifth chances, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, or they they, you know, they understand that they can take care of these people in a different world, in a different way than society can and give them a chance to, you know, be somebody instead of being a pariah. Um, and there are there are some not, I don't want to say ringleaders, but people who run these shows who take advantage of that, you know. But there are more good ones that I have found than bad ones. So, um, but that that reputation, just throwing that out there, that reputation is sometimes true, but most of the time isn't. Uh, these are just people who are trying to make it in life, and they are outsiders, outcasts. They don't get along with society as a whole, and that might seem funny because they are literally dealing with the general public, but it's no different doing that job and, you know, work, working with people like that than it is doing retail. It's literally the, the, the same thing. You're just dealing with people. Um, anyways, but I wanted to clear that up. It was like, these people are dirty, nasty, whatever. No, they're just like, and, and also when you go, unless they tell you differently, when you go to like a, a fair or carnival or whatever in your local area, and they ask for food. Um, they're not asking for food for charity unless they're saying that they're collecting canned goods for a certain charity. They're mm -hmm. you're literally feeding them is what you're doing. Um, they collect canned goods so that they have food while they're on the road. Um, that's where they get the vast majority of their food. Um, so when you go, if if you have canned goods to spare, definitely take your canned goods. You're helping somebody out. Hey Vamp. Hey Paul. How you doing? Come on in.
probably change this. Oh, if for so everybody knows we're at just over fourteen thousand words right now. Yeah, damn. Look at this thing grow. Look at it grow. I'm gonna share my screen here in a minute. Okay. Uh, just letting, just letting them know. I'm trying to.
Oh, this is an 89. They wouldn't have done that. Never mind.
Hey, what season is it? I'm. I know uh, <clears throat> Cassidy has to wear a coat, um, or uh, Bethany tells him to wear a coat when he goes out to uh, shoplift the first time. Mm-hmm. What What do you What do you foresee this being? Fall or winter? Or we don't even really know. Is it southern? Because- uh, yeah, I think it's southern. And I was thinking at the top, maybe like to start the whole book off, maybe we should put the South, comma, 1989. Because we had talked hurt. about whether yeah. or not we're, I don't think it's best that we do use a date. Okay. Um, but as far as, I don't know. We, yeah, we did do the, <clears throat> I mean, it could be, I haven't spent very much time in the South, so I don't yeah. know. That's what I was going to get at. Because if we're doing if we're doing cold, it's either January or February. Um, it starts to get cold in December, um, but usually it's still in the seventies, sixties. But don't 70s. you ha- don't you have just cold off days like every place else? Uh, not really. Uh, like, like say when, in April or May or something like that. You have. I like mean, a- it's it's cooler. Like we get breezes. Um, but that's pretty much it. Um, it's still about, you know, seventies in the spring, uh, mm-hmm. coat weather around here is pretty much only January and, uh, January and February, though you'll see people in December because they're used to the heat all year round, um, wearing a coat. I mean, we could, it could be a cold snap, but then we'd have to, I don't know. Um, I also don't know what the weather was like here in the 80s. So I can talk to some people around here because from my experience, the weather has changed drastically just in the past 10 years here. Uh, We used to get like more seasons than we actually do now. Now we don't have a fall whatsoever. It goes from uh, peak summer heat to cooling off maybe 10 degrees directly into winter. Um, So we go like... uh, Nobody ever wears coats during Halloween. Um, Thanksgiving get-togethers is not a coat function. <laughs> uh, every now and again, there's a fluke, and it'll start cooling off uh, like mid-November. But for the most part, it's usually hot in a... Yeah, here's Tim. Tim uh, lived in Alabama, too. He's like, yeah, we have two seasons. It's either burning apocalypse or freezing. Um, and that's because we have such a drastic change in the weather. Um, it goes from sweltering to cold like almost literally overnight. Um, I've had uh, situations where it's been 80 degrees uh, one day and then 59 the next. So that's, that's the severity of it. But I I was thinking, you know, if we're doing, but if we're doing January or February with the coat, then the carnival wouldn't be in town. Um, They wouldn't have that. That's their off season. So I'm wondering uh, if we want to put something like uh, um, it's an, not a, unnatural unseasonal cold snap has come through or something uh i don't know or we could <laughs> just make a comment from somebody saying you know uh how it's too you know he's worried about getting caught because like when when um when oh, no, Shane wait, is- wait a second the only reason he's taking the fucking coat is because he to wants to pack it to shoplift with yeah so I'm Shane creating could be up- problems that don't fucking exist Okay, never mind. Shane's but anyway, yeah, he's waiting outside the window, and he could he could uh, make some, uh, you know, have some thought about how uh, he's worried that this person's going to realize he's wearing a coat when he certainly yeah. doesn't need one. Wait, it's wait, funny you talk wait. about all this weather. I I the last time I was uh, south was driving through Tennessee, uh, Georgia uh, to Florida, mm-hmm. and I think it was uh, late um they're very early spring and we were freezing and all the pictures that we have from that trip we're all wearing winter coats and i remember <laughs> i remember standing in line at uh um well disney world and yeah we're freaking bundled up and we're from michigan so it's not like we weren't used to right. you know the cold it was freaking cold and i was like this is florida that's 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 i cannot i cannot express how odd that is yeah um because that's i've what been we were told we, we usually go to like uh, when we d- did go to like Universal Studios and uh, Walt Disney World. Um, when we went down there, uh, we would go in the end of December or January because, you know, it, it's still warm enough to enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not, you know, but it's usually the 
you know, after Christmas is when we would go. It's also the, like pretty much the off season. Uh, it's not as busy uh, because it is technically colder than, you know, it, it normally is. But, yeah, that's when we usually go. I mean, we go to theme parks at the end of December and early January because of that, because of the weather. You know, you're not standing out under the heat of the sun all day and mm -hmm. it's not sweltering. And like Tim said, the other day it was 95 degrees and raining. And when it rains here, it does not cool down. It, it only gets hotter because of the humidity. It's like walking through fucking soup. Yeah, it depends. Sometimes it'll it'll cool down 10 degrees, and then sometimes the rain... It depends on how long it rains, I should say. If it just yeah. doesn't rain for very long, it just makes it worse, man, and yeah. it gets real humid. I, I think a lot of people have misconceptions about about Michigan, and they think it's like... I think they think it's like Alaska or something. <laughs> we normally don't... Uh, if if we don't have if I don't if we don't see snow until like Christmas, that's not uncommon. And I, I it's been I remember once it was eighty degrees on Christmas, but I mean that's you know that's just I think just like anywhere else you have days that are like wow okay this is weird yeah definitely but, um, yeah the the main reason I'm asking is I wanted to handle you know what the weather was like while he was out walking because he's by himself. I guess I could do something else, but I also wanted to give some kind of feel for what it feels like this day that he's out looking for Cassidy. I was just thinking about all that weather, and I was like, I was thinking we should we should make it uh, hot in this place that they're living, like just right. kind of like uncomfortable. Yeah, miserable. Like there's they don't have AC. Um, so far, we haven't mentioned, but I was just I was writing. That's exactly what I'm going to use. That's exactly what I'm going to use. I'm going to have him walk out of the sweltering house. He's he's already dug dug the dit, the the hole. He's taken a shower with his clothes. It's a very funny scene. Anyway, I I thought it was anyways. But uh he's taking a shower. Um he's cleaned up the dog poop in the room and he's heading outside to go look for Cassidy after a a weird uh back and forth with Rita and he's heading outside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to bring it uh, it's I'm going to talk about how much cooler it is coming from the inside, the sweltering environment, going into the outside with the breeze. So mm -hmm. that's that's how I'm going to use that, just to give people some kind of so, something to root them in place.
I got to run the restroom. I'll probably end up taking a break, too. So I'll be back in about 10, 15 minutes. Okay, man. Oh, do you want to share your screen or you just want to go off? I, I might as well share it. Yeah. Give, give the people something to look at other than my chair. And your pretty face. Not that your pretty face ain't ain't enough, but, you know, you got to give these folks something extra. They're, they're spending all their time with us. Now. I'm in a mood today, man. I told you I'm in a mood. Uh, add to screen. All right. I'll be back.
Okay. I think I'll let y'all watch uh, Chad for a while. Give him the anxiety he deserves. I'm <laughs> kidding. Love you, Chad. Let's see what you've been doing up here. Ooh, you've been busy. Oh, not really. I read most of that. Never mind. <clears throat> this is all new. This is? Yeah. Maybe not the first line. Oh, okay. All right. That's what I was... Okay. You can take a shit on the floor for all I care. That's <laughs> unintentionally foreshadowing what happens in my section <laughs> that I just got through writing. Sorry. I'm not saying that Cassidy shit on the floor, but there is shit on the floor when <laughs> when uh what's his name? When Shane wakes up the next day.
oh, you're still using some of my stuff. That's cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I try to as much as I can. I mean, I know things have changed a lot mm -hmm. after we talked about, you know, whether or not they should mention Cooter. Gotcha. So, yeah, I'm, I'm coming in here and I'm trying to okay. read through it, trying to grab pull stuff. <clears throat> I wouldn't. I wouldn't going to be a bit upset if you just, you know, continued on without it. Like I said, I'm just laying foundation, brother. <clears throat> I'm just glad you like some of this stuff enough to keep it. I'm not you. I'm not. I guess I. I don't know. Maybe it's self-deprecating, but I'm not used to this. I'm not used to collaborating with someone. I'm either collaborate with people who are leagues better than me, who end up rewriting the entire thing, or I collaborate with someone new who doesn't know anything. So I'm going back and rebuilding their stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not used to people keeping anything that I write when I collab. So. Well, what's, uh, this, what's the sense of collaborating if it's, you know? Well, I mean, it's that that's kind of what I'm getting at. You know, I just it's I guess this is the first real collaboration that I've had, like, you know, building off of each other instead of just mm -hmm. going our own ways or being just completely, you know, torn down and rebuilt. So because I've had like, like I've said, I've, I've had it both ways. I've had it where someone has taken what I've had completely gotten rid of all of it and then rebuilt using what I had, um, just saying what I said, basically in their own style, their own words and whatnot. Um, and then I've had people where I've had to go back and rebuild their stuff. Um, and I try to use as much as their stuff as possible, but no one's ever done that with me. So mm -hmm. it's just a, it's just a completely new experience. This goes to show you never know what you're walking into when you do a collab. Yeah, that's very true. No matter how much you know the other person's work, too. <laughs> Sorry. That's some kind of joke. What's wrong with Dwayne? Sounds like DeWitt. That's what... What's wrong with it? You trying to make my kid out of your ass? Uh, can we? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's why I changed the name. The I changed the spelling of the word Dwayne, so it was more yeah. Do Dwayne. Yeah, that's that's even funnier. Um, I don't. I actually don't know what would be funnier here. Is like you trying to name my kid after your ex, or you trying to name your my kid after my daddy? <laughs> sorry. It's just a hammer home them. Yeah. Anyways, anyways, <laughs> it's just it's just so fucked up, man. <laughs> Beyond fucked up. Like I, forgot, I forgot that that was his dad. Yeah, uh, I was I was wondering because I I didn't know if you uh, had him call Rita Mama uh, because you'd forgot or if uh, everyone in the house just calls her Mama. <laughs> anyways, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking daddy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's dark. Oh, that's dark and beautiful. Oh, my God. Oh, like. I kind of want to go back and say. Like, first. I ain't your mama. <laughs> Second, long as that asshole don't come knocking on my door asking what. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to throw that in there. You can delete it if you want to. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so, so much fun. Duane. <laughs> now I can't say it in my head any other way. <laughs> Duane. <laughs> uh. Hunter offering him coke.
Ugh. These people give me the fucking heebie-jeebies, man. Uh, God damn it! No, no, I don't want to. I don't want to read about them fucking. No, <laughs> I'm I'm going away. I'm running, and my tail between my legs. Yeah, I think we've I think we've established a very dysfunctional, uh, a very unhealthy household here. <laughs> you got that fucking right. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny that you bring that up, Alex, because, uh, uh, I saw the, the ridiculousness of what Musk named his child is even more ridiculous no. when you hear his responses during interviews and what they call the child, um, because they don't call the child any of the sequence of letters or numbers or whatever the fuck it, they just, they, they call him something completely different. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head and I don't want to quote him incorrectly but um they they don't even call him by his binary code name <sighs> or her i don't know which one it is but i was also <laughs> there's a there's something going on right now that i find hilarious uh so jack smith uh subpoenaed um and this isn't really political this is kind of like a, a side to all the stuff that's going on but um, Jack Smith subpoenaed Twitter for Trump's uh, private DMs, which they can legally do, but Twitter has been fighting them uh, tooth and nail to try and get, they keep losing, um, and they were slapped with a $350,000 uh, fine and a couple other things, and they finally decided to give it over, but they were begging the, the Jack Smith's people begging them to uh to at least let them tell trump that they'd been subpoenaed and they're like no you you can't that's part we will find you again if you do that um you know you're not not allowed to tell him and uh i just find it funny because there is interviews with musk who says that he he voted he voted for biden so i'm unsure why the, this whole thing is even going on because Twitter obviously does not care about people's privacy. <clears throat> and I just find the whole situation just utterly amusing. Um, yeah, they, they've, they've handed them over, but there was a lot of fight uh, going back and forth. Um, they handed them over. And now, of course, Trump knows because it's been made public, but he didn't know when they handed it over. Yeah, that doesn't mean he's going to he, he also endorsed Trump, uh, but uh, it, he he's he said something about what kind of person would I be if um, I, I didn't vote for Biden? That was one of the quotes from the interview. It's it's on it's online if you want to go watch it. It's a very interesting, uh, very interesting. Uh, they asked if he voted for Trump and he's like, no, 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 no. Like, what kind of person would I be if I voted voted for Trump? I 100 percent voted for for Biden. And then he gives his reasons.
wait a second, for real? Why is Google Docs telling me to change flyer, F-L-Y-E-R, to flyer, F-L-I-E-R? I don't know. Yeah, it's an advertising circular, F-L-Y-E-R. It's obvious that's what I'm, anyways. Ignore. Thank you. Cornstarch? Has anyone ever cut their drugs with cornstarch? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. And that's funny. And you know, when you, you can do crap a, gets wet. It makes that, you know. No, I, the, the oak lick or whatever, but uh, you're not you're not making it wet. So it's, when you have the, the Coke is, is, is a dry pro product unless you're doing like a, a, a speed ball or you're smoking the rock. Um, but if it's in powder form, it's pretty much that's for snorting. Um, I meant I meant once it gets up there. Oh, once it gets up there, well, I yeah, mean, yeah, you got these globules of cornstarch and one hundred percent, one hundred percent. It is not a uh, a fine product to consume, but yeah. But yes, uh, oblic or a non Newtonian fluid. That's uh, that's what it's called. When you add cornstarch to water, you apply any impact whatsoever and it turns into a solid. Yeah, Google Docs does have a strange spell check. It also, well, they, they fixed it since the last time I did it, but I had horrible lag even with fiber um, less than a year ago when I tried it. And uh, now it's like, it's, it's perfect. I'm having no problems whatsoever. And there was a weird glitch at one point when I tried it where I would type a letter and it would duplicate that letter multiple times <clears throat> with no rhyme or reason.
Okay. <clears throat> I just finished uh, Cook and Smile. Okay.
I have a feeling you're going to change most of that. There's a, I did something and I have no idea. I, I guess I'm planting, uh, I guess I'm plant, planting seeds. Uh, <clears throat> hey, NC, how you doing? Ah, I keep clicking on the wrong fucking tab. All right, let me go back up here and read your finishing move. That's great. All right. <clears throat> yeah, Jeff's good people. He's one of those guys that get a odd rap because of the stuff he writes, but he's just like Edward Lee. They're both good people, but they write the most atrocious shit. Even though Jeff Strand is funnier than than he is horrifying. He's just really weird. And I like weird. Are you did Alec leave? Is that what happened? Anyways, have a good one, Alec, if that's the case. If only had a brain. I didn't have this one. I think I'm missing maybe one that I can find. But that's everything you did. Oh my god, I know you wanted that because and then he sent me the new ones on Friday. Friday. Today's Friday. Yesterday just got the other one. Wait a second. NC Jeff Jeff Strand signed with Scholastic. 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 <clears throat> That's a word that I hate. Not a company I hate, but a word I hate. It's like Jurassic. Jurassic. I always want to say Jurassic, and I know the difference. People used to pick on me so hard in school when Jurassic Park first came out because my, I'm just, yeah, I'm bad at saying words like that. Uh, like across, um, I will, if I don't pay attention, I'll say across. Even my own family picks on me. And I'm talking about like Shell and my kids. <laughs> they pick on me about that one. It's a cross, not a cross. I'm like, how long? How long y'all know me? Like, the kids, your entire life, have I ever said anything properly?
you know if World War Three should, uh, if we should be using numerals, Roman numerals? Supposedly, according to style manuals, you're su if it's if it's dialogue, you're supposed to write it out no matter how large the mm -hmm. number or no matter if it's Roman noodle noodles. <laughs> the, 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 Roman noodles. No, no matter it, no matter, no matter, yeah, no matter if it's Roman numerals or not, uh, you're supposed to type it all out. Do, does everyone follow style manuals? Fuck no. So if you want to do the, I'm just, I got traditional brain, traditional publishing brain. So, um, I'm, one of well, my this isn't this isn't dialogue. I'm just referring to the the scene that you wrote, um, where Cassidy's could sleep through <clears throat> World War Three. I guess we can we can switch it back. So I, I probably just did that out of force of habit. Three looks weird. Know. Seeing the number or seeing the word three looks weird. That's fine. As long as it's well, even if it was dialogue, I don't think it would hurt changing it. So that, that that's not something I'm gonna be like, no, Chad, don't fuck it up. No, it's just that's just my own brain. Yeah, if it was dialogue, I would spell it out probably. Okay. I'm trying to decide whether or not I'm going to. I mean, we're only an hour forty eight into this. I've already written three pages. I'm trying to decide if I want to calm down or not. If I want to, like, I don't know. Uh, if I want to just push forward. But I also, I need a heads up if there's, like, a scene you specifically want to write. Because I am just fucking booking over here. And I don't... Well, I did, that. I wanted to write the graveyard scene, which I did. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and I'm guessing you probably see clearer in your head him meeting Shenna. And yeah. that would be the that would be I don't know how many more scenes you want after this because uh posted Bill's chapter is uh he when he goes out and tries to find Cassidy, um, runs across him in a field. Uh but before that he finds the poster and then um I have them heading home now. Uh and that's pretty much where that chapter ends. And I don't know if you want to go directly from that to him going out to the carnival. Or if you want some more buildup in the house uh, between now and then. It's hard to say because I'm so freaking sick of this house. <laughs> I'm sick of these people. I know. I know. So am I. That's what I'm wondering if we want to just go ahead and get him out there and have a, a positive interaction, a positive moment, other than the graveyard scene, of course. A positive moment, finally, because we're already, you know, a, a no novelette into this book. So... Mm -hmm. um something to keep people you know something something that people are like this fucking book's depressing <laughs> because that's bound to happen and the chapters are just short enough that it's going to keep people reading they're like something good needs to happen soon because <laughs> this poor kid's getting the business um anyways the when when you finally catch up on what i've written uh i have don't don't even ask me what the fuck the cornbread scene means uh, Rita's stumbling around the house the next morning after, well, after he's done digging and he's done, he's taking a shower. She's walking, she's like tweaking as she walks through the house, uh, coked out or whatever. And she's looking for her cornbread that doesn't exist. So I don't know if you want to keep it or not, but it's in there. And I don't know if it's like a seed for cornbread, meaning something else. I have no idea, but it's there and you can do what you want with it. So. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I think I'm going to, yeah, I think I'm going to take, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to take a break and come back and write some more, or what, how, how far have we gotten today? You've written quite a bit, too. I have, I, uh, <clears throat> but I did, I did kill some stuff that was, you know, all the, the cooter talk, like, uh, right. all, because we decided we were doing it a different way. But I've also so, added four pages, so. <laughs> so our word count is uh you know will show up differently you know i probably killed i don't know maybe four or five hundred words but yeah. maybe 400 words um, well i replaced that easily easily so i'm not a bit worried about that i think i wrote about i only wrote about 600 six 600 700 um let's see what we got Okay, we've gotten um, 
just under 2,000 written today. So over 2,000 considering I, I took about 400 out. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to be able to jump ahead. I, I keep meaning to, and even though I'm dabbling a little bit every day, I would love to be able to just, you know, knock out, you know, knock out a big chunk of this, you know, like revisions or whatever. Um, especially now that I'm at a point where, you know, because I had to I had to write most of Oh, well, the day before I wrote the entire Grave, grave Matters mm -hmm. chapter and then had to write about half of the Coconut Smile since we switched things up and I had to do the, the you know, him, come, Uncle Travis or coming home and all that crap. And then um, pulled as much as I could that was still... Um, applicable to uh, the new direction with Cooter. Um, but now I'm caught up, I think, in a, in a, in a linear sense. Yeah. Um, where I think out I also is. need to go back and read from the beginning just so I get the... Uh, I'll probably do that off stream. Um, go back and get the full breadth of what you've done all in one go now that you're happy with all the way up to Coke and a smile because that's a big chunk of the beginning. Mm -hmm. make sure that we're on the same page as far as what's happened and what hasn't happened. <clears throat> I'll add your screen back on there. Yeah, I'm going to take a break. When I come back, we'll talk about what we're going to do next. Um, I'm excited to get to the carnival too. I, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I got, I already got like five or five or six. No, it's five. Um, I got one I probably won't end up doing, but I got like at least five scenes. Uh, just the random people. I even have a scene for boobs. So it's just kind of like a, a seed at this point, see what it grows into. But um, I think the the um, the end of the, the first act and all of the second act will probably be the most fun to write. Yeah. Yep. I agree. This is I, I already feel this becoming a book that I don't want to end because I got I, I know we're going to get into the carnival and we're just going to have a fucking blast. This is so much that you can do with that mm -hmm. um, and still be up 100 percent original because no two carnivals are the same. Yeah, I love that shit. Anyways, all right, I'm going to take a break and come back. We can either talk more or we can write more or whatever the fuck you want to do. OK.
Ultimate Cannibal Creator that Matt sold out. That was the one, yes. Yeah. Turning my camera off so I can have some lunch and you guys don't have to see me eat. But I'm still here.
Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Goddamn trash service picked up our can, literally like took it away. I freaking hate that. Um, thinking it was someone else who hadn't paid their bill. So mm -hmm. I was on the phone with them and the lady was like, I see you're paid up, but they didn't take your can. I was like, my can's gone. I don't know what the hell. I need my can back. So please come get my damn can. Bring, bring my can back. And she's like, okay, well, I can have it out there in the next couple of days. I was like, you're going to make me sit out here with trash piled up on my porch. For the next couple days, we go through a lot of trash here. Um, anyways, but uh, yeah, that's happened to us before, and it took them. It took them because uh, they kept forgetting. It took them weeks to. I mean, I, I don't know how it is over there, but we can it, just put put our bags on the curb, no problem. But no, we don't um, really. Here they want ha them. It has to be in a bag. If we live in the if we lived in the city, they pick up. They do curb service. Um, like once a week, they they'll even pick up like uh, branches and you know just piles of shit. Uh, yeah. They bring a truck out with a little crane and scoop. But uh, out here in the country, I mean, my nearest neighbor is like half a mile away. Um, I don't have anybody around me, so I don't know what. But then again, my mail gets we there's County Road 51, which is what I live on. And then there's County Road 57. And our mail always ends up going to the address, the same number address on 57, even though a seven and a one doesn't look anything like each other. Um, I mean, we're always getting it. They, they never deliver the 57 mail to us. They only deliver the 51 mail to 57. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I have that issue. So I'm wondering if they, if these folks with the trash service went and picked up the, the one or were supposed to pick up the one out on 57. I don't know what they did. But uh, anyways, so she said she'd have it back out tomorrow morning because um, I was fussing with her about all that. But yeah, I just... I live out in the middle of nowhere. I shouldn't have these issues, but I still do. I grew up in the country, and I it was fun when I was a kid. But man, when I became a teenager, and I <clears throat> and uh, stayed with my girlfriend, she lived closer to the city, and then I moved to Denver, and I was just like, man, I've hated the country ever since. Yeah. I'm I'm not a country person. Shell wasn't until we got out here and. She realized how much we were left alone. I mean, we've had some, we've had, uh, oddly enough, in 2020, we had issues with the Klan. Um, but we had gotten flyers in the mailbox. Uh, usually it happened every fall when they do. Around here, uh, even though they're designated as a terrorist organization, the city, my city allows them to have a parade. Um, so one day every year they have a parade downtown um, and they'll pass out flyers and federally it's a crime for them to pass out flyers, but my city doesn't really care. They just consider themselves, a, they, they consider them another organization. But, uh, and even the citizens of this city have complained because they don't mail out that, they don't mail them out. They leave them without any postage in people's mailboxes, which is, a, again, a federal crime. Um, so that that stopped in 2020. And then they started plastering uh, like Walmart parking lot or whatever. They would leave it underneath your uh, your uh, windshield wiper or whatever. Um, then they started doing metallic, not metallic, uh, magnetic, not, not stickers, but magnets that just slap on people's cars. Um, with like either the their their symbol the I don't I don't know how to explain it but they got a certain symbol for the clan mm -hmm. um, and then um, there's uh, whites rights ones that they're putting on people's cars uh, anyways mm -hmm. but we we've had issues with them literally coming onto our property 
uh, had to run them off. Uh, and when we first moved in, <clears throat> uh, I came by myself because it is the country and I know how people work around here uh, to meet the guy that I was buying the property off of. I went by myself. I didn't bring Shell and the kids. So they had no idea, you know, that I was married to a black woman and I had mixed kids um, and got the property, took care of all that. Uh, about a week later, Labor Day comes around and people have started the, the people that are around this area, you know, of course, have seen us out in the yard and whatnot, moving in, so on and so forth. Labor Day weekend, we get a string of pickup trucks and they got the they're coming down this way. So it's the driver's side that are that's facing us and the outside of the windows there there's a rebel flag on one um hanging out of the uh the driver's side window the next car back has the uh kkk flag um and then another flag in the back uh on the side so it's facing us is what i'm getting at there's another rebel flag hanging over the wheel well um and then uh they go they go down they disappear down the way a bit and then we start hearing pop 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 and i'm like i call the cops and they're like well if they're not on their property on your property there's nothing we can do about it i'm like if they're out here shooting from their trucks come and do so do i have you did you see them shooting from their trucks uh it's like okay i know who i'm dealing with now so that literally a uh, week after i moved in i went out and got a shotgun and uh that's how i chased them off the uh the the time they were actually on the property because i have a tree line um, my dr my driveway dead ends in my property, and then I have a tree line all the way down. Uh, my driveway is 500 feet long, um, and I had this basketball court up against the tree line. I'm sitting out there uh, smoking when it's about dusk, and I look up and I see this figure in the trees. So I bring and I posted all this to Twitter when it happened. Um, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the dude's just standing there, I mean, in hood and all. And it looks like some kind of like, you know, fucking Sasquatch kind of kind of thing or whatever. But I can see when I look up, I can see what it is. And it's a white hood. I'm like, well, fuck this. So I, go inside, I got my shotgun. Shell calls the police. Um, and I let one off into the air and I we didn't hear anything else. Uh, but before that, I think they were having like some kind of rally or something on my property because I have 250 acres and the you could hear it and when i posted just the the part that you could hear it sounded like you know like a coyote or something something screaming off in the distance but yeah i watched I, it yeah but what i heard was like melodic singing like almost like gospel music or whatever mm -hmm. um so i think they were having some kind of rally or something out on my property didn't realize that you know somebody lived out here or maybe they did who knows i don't know if they were trying to scare us off or not but for the next three months, um, after that happened, we went, uh, I let my niece and her uh, husband, who's a cop, uh, stay at our place while we went out to New Mexico to try and find a new place to live. That was completely busted. The only thing we could find were scams. It was absolutely terrible housing market, even back then. Um, so we came back and, well, I'd been in contact with my niece and her husband while they were out here and damn near every night for a week, three trucks would come up to the end of our drive and sit there. Uh, finally, the third night, uh, the, my, not, I guess, nephew in law, I don't know what to call him, but my, my niece's husband goes out in his uniform onto the front porch with his hand on his gun and they turn around and they, they, they take off, never came back again. So I don't know if they, if they think now they haven't bothered us since. And I don't, I don't know if it's because they think a cop lives here now or what, but Anyways, they're scared off. Um, but that has been the only problem I've had living out in the country is, is that. Um, and and may, of course, mail service is going to be wonky out here, especially with the close addresses. But uh, yeah, it's been a great experience out here and Shell loves it. Um, the only thing she doesn't like is having to drive, you know, 30 minutes into town just to go to like Walmart or Toto. We don't go to Walmart. You go to Target or to pick up food or whatever. Can't get pizza delivered out here. But other than that, man, we love it out here. Uh, and nobody, nobody bothers us other than that one scenario. Nobody has bothered us since. Um, I have had a, I had a weird situation where this drone came over my property, um, and once again, unless it's a, unless it's a very, very high end drone, there's no way they could have got all the way out here because, like I said, I got 250 acres, um, unless they were somewhere near. 
So I went out looking and I found this pickup truck parked in one of the access roads to my property. Uh, to give you a little more information on the property, I own 250, but only 200 and no, sorry, only 20 acres of it is inhabitable because of paper mill runoff. Uh, the guy I bought it for, I bought the entire piece of property for $50,000, all 250 acres for $50,000. And I didn't realize why it was so cheap until years later. He didn't, the old man, he's dead now. He died of cancer. But when he sold me the property, he didn't tell me that the paper mill had paid him off for the pollution that had killed the other 230 acres. And um, it wasn't until I tried to sell the property that I found out that I couldn't sell it. The EPA wouldn't let me sell it until it was cleaned up. And I'm like, well, shouldn't I be able to sue the paper mill or whatever? So I contacted the paper mill. The paper mill was like, no, we paid out, or I almost said his name, but we paid out the, the dude who was already dead at this point. Um, and it was around the same time that he sold me the property for 50,000. So he literally took the millions, I think 1.2 million that he was supposed to use to clean up the property and just fucked off, sold the property $50,000 and, and, you know, went, went off. I don't know if he was dying then or not, but you know, would you, would you buy that much land for it? Do you, do you hunt? Can you hunt on it? No, I was, I was actually planning on putting trailers out here, like clearing out land and making one big, uh, trailer park or something, you know, mm -hmm. for like, a. Uh, low-income families whatnot you know charging like three four hundred dollars a month for you know two bedroom one bath trailers maybe a little bit more for a bigger trailer that was my plan uh to have some kind of retirable retirement you know income to yeah. that would come in and uh that was the, that was literally a whole reason i wanted to do something you know give people uh affordable sustainable housing um, and maybe even start like a garden community thing, not like a like a cult compound or whatever, but, you know, just have something, you know, maybe a little playground or whatever. Because um, my son had this idea when he was five years old. He said he wanted when he grew up, he wanted to buy a hotel and turn it into free housing for the homeless. So I was like, OK, well, I just got this big advance um, and this property is only, you know, fifty thousand dollars. Let me grab this up and then I can, you know, take care of all that. And then. Um, after doing that, royalties and everything started getting worse and worse um, until finally I didn't have any contracts or anything. And I just had the Lorne name and my graphic design work that I was working off of. And that was paying the bills. And we had a little bit over, left over for entertainment. Um, but it kind of just all fell through because I wasn't getting the big checks like I was. Um, so it never happened. And I, I never went I, I never traveled deep in into my property because it's a lot. Uh, and you just come to find out that most of the land out here, like I said, 230 acres are literally not inhabitable because of the paper mill runoff. And I was wondering because half the fucking forest is, is dead. It's just white trees sticking up out of the ground. Also, a little bit of the horror fan in me kind of liked the creepy aspect of that. Um, but like I said, come to find out the EPA wouldn't even let me offload this until I got it cleaned up. And the only way that I could offload it is to sign a uh, paperwork that said, and I, don't, I have no idea to this day how the hell this, this dude got around all this. Because as soon as I went down to file uh, the, the paperwork to get it sold, that's when it all hit me. I have no idea how he was able to do it. I got the deed and everything to this property. But anyways, no, but nobody stopped it from happening. And the only way that I can do that, uh, that I can sell it, is if I clean up this property. So I'm stuck with it. Unless... I put in there a waiver that tells the person who's buying it that they have to clean it up when they purchase it. So, and I, I went through all my paperwork. Nothing in there says that I, I, I was responsible for cleaning up this mess. He was a hundred percent responsible for it. Um, I can't find any of his family. I can't, I couldn't find anybody. I don't know if he died alone or what, but yeah, he just, he's gone and I'm stuck with this property. Hmm. So, <clears throat> But the, uh, the EPA even threatened to come out and claim the land without paying me for it because it was never clean, cleaned up. So I had to show, I had to send in all these documents showing that I purchased the land off of this guy. Um, I can I can no longer contact the guy because he's passed away. And the only reason I found that out is Facebook. It's like so-and-so died this day, whatever. I just went looking for his name. Anyways, um, so so we're stuck. But other than that, I love it out here. <laughs> I said all that just to get around to. I love it out here. I love not being bothered. I love not having neighbors because I'm a city boy. I grew, I, I was born and raised in Inglewood, California. Um, I live deep in the projects. 
Uh, and I, I even lived on the street where they shot Friday at one point in time. Uh, that's Compton. But anyway, so we moved, we moved around a lot. Um, and I like noise. It's really hard for me to get to sleep without noise. So mm -hmm. I literally have to have like, you know, white, white noise going on in the background when I go to sleep. Um, sometimes well, I can't do that in the wind. Uh, I usually run the, the ceiling fan and I have this little thing called a Bornado. It's this little powerful fan. That's about the size of a Bluetooth speaker. Uh, I run that and that's noisy, but I don't do that in the winter. Of course, and I want to free shell out. Uh, so I, I usually listen to white noise to get to sleep because I'm used to just the constant noise of traffic and all that stuff. Um, but other, once again, other than all that, I love living out here. Um, and also some nights it is so loud out here just because of the crickets, the frogs, the coyotes, the, you know, birds, what, what have you, it's usually mm -hmm. hella noisy. So we'll like crack the window in the fall and I'll let that, that noise do it for me. Um, but it, it's funny that even, even in that sense, we're, we're opposites. Like you grew up in the country. I grew up in the city. I now live in the country and you now live in the city. So. Well, yeah, but I get the best of both worlds. I am a, I'm exactly one block from one of the busiest uh, streets in town, but I live on a lake Ooh. and <clears throat> there's woods right here. So we get um, deer and cranes cool. and geese and all kinds of crap and, you know, raccoons in our yard. Um, so it's like, it's weird. You would never know that I'm a block from this, this road, th this busy road, because gotcha. you can't really hear it. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and then of course the, you know, like I got two windows in my office and I live like on a corner of a lake. So out one window, I see like the big lake and then out wow. the window behind me is, I see the cove, which is, uh, um, and then the, just on the other side of the cove is like a $3 million house. So my neighborhood is really, uh, it's quiet. It's not, you know, it's wow. nice. we got good neighbors. That's cool. I've, I've had nothing but bad neighbors and landlords. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I just saw you reverse century. I don't know if you're still in here, but the novel's going very well. We are adding about, right now, we're kind of averaging 2,000 words a day. So it's 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 blazing along right now. Um, yeah, that sounds gorgeous, man. That's a, a, yeah, we love it, man. Perfect. Uh, right across the street from me is a hunting preserve. Uh, and... There's, uh, I think it's another, I say right across the street from me, but you'd have to go down 500 feet to the road and then on the other side of the road, because on my entire road, there's only, there's really only two residents and it's about a three mile road and, and there's us and then there's the hunting lodge that's across the, the street. Um, and uh, so it's, it's basically only us two out here but uh when i was living down the hill because i had put there are three trailers on my property there's the one my mother lived in and then we lived on the one there and then i had one up the hill that i was going to start renting before she died and we decided to just move up the hill and sell the property um and so that i got two empty trailers that we keep up down down the hill that i could be renting out but i don't know if i'm going to move you know and I don't want to screw someone over. So I got that down there. But anyways, when we lived down the hill, I used to be, it was right by the road. My mother lived in the one by the road that ran this way. And then we had a trailer that runs this way. So it's like an L and we were able to see the property across. And in the fall, when the trees are thin, you can see their lake and it is absolutely gorgeous. I, some, some mornings I would just sit out on the porch and you know, have a cigarette or whatever, or have my coffee before I started smoking again. And I would just sit out there. Now, here's here's something for you. Um, and you can choose to believe it if you want to or not. Everybody I tell this to just kind of rolls their eyes and doesn't believe it. There is a white, a large white creature that lives out here. Um, it is bi It is capable of bipedal. It is capable of bipedal, but it also walks on all fours. Everyone around here has seen it at some point in time, and it's usually in the fall. And you can see it walk along through 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 the trees. We've seen it up here. We've seen it down there. We don't know what the fuck it is. I'm not saying it's supernatural, but uh, it, it is capable. It's almost the size of a polar bear, but it's thin and kind of shaped like a deer. But it's capable of walking on its hind legs. So you can do with that what you want. But I swear I've seen it and everybody else in my family has seen it. And people who have come in over to this area have, have noticed it. 
There's also a, a, a legend of a cougar um, that roams these 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 here hills uh, that I've never seen, but people around here swear it's out there. Uh, do you have a publication date in mind? No, we're, we're probably going traditionally published with this one, so it, it's going to be a while. Um, and it'll probably change drastically after the once once they get there, not drastically, but that's why I'm, I'm not too worried about sharing stuff like this because it, it'll change as we go along. Um, and uh, publishers do frown on, you know, work being out there before publication. But uh, uh, we we can we can do enough to it that uh, that it'll be different from what you guys end up reading by the end. I got to call my wife. Real quick. OK. So no, no, uh, no publication date in mind, but uh, we do have we do have options. I got at least two publishers I have inside uh, people with, and uh, yeah, so we'll we'll shop those. And if push comes to shove, we'll we might go with a small press. But the whole point of this is to get a little uh, bigger uh, readership for the both of us. <clears throat> All right, I'm back. Okay. How many pages does your current state of novel accumulate to? About 40. We got roughly, it says over here we have 42, but we got a couple of end pages of, uh, what's it called? Uh, notes and plot points and whatnot. Like, here, I'll, sh I'll share my screen and show you what I'm talking about. I'll be right back. Right. Yeah, you're fine. Um, so here's the body of the book. And keep on scrolling down down babe oh so it's quite a bit it's actually six pages of notes so we got a later scene that'll probably end up getting trashed because i think he's written all over it um and it's completely different outcome so let me go ahead and get this actually no i'll i'll leave it just in case just in case uh then we got some notes on the characters uh some plot stuff quality of life and the characters, who everybody is. And we got the carnies, some uh, dialogue that's going to be used later on. Um, and then an outline that we got to chapter three with, but we pretty much broke all that and made them smaller chapters. <clears throat> so we are several chapters in, 14,000 words in, about 32, no, 36 pages is where we're at right now. I think I'm done writing for the day.
I think I'm done. Um, um, let's see here. I'm definitely going to be working on this Sunday uh, before the, uh, game night. So uh, it'll it'll grow even more even after tomorrow. I'm just not sure where I want to go next because I want to leave the Shenna meeting for you. Um, I could just jump ahead and do some kind of, I don't know, I don't know, some kind of interaction sequence. Um, but I do need to go back over all, everything that you've read and digest that, make sure I have the right timeline in my head still um, before I get too far. Uh, I definitely don't want you to have to change a bunch of shit in these newer chapters. And I think I'm on I think I'm on the same page as you, but we'll see. Maybe we should maybe we should take the whole weekend off so that I can catch up. Yeah, try to get through some of this. And, okay. Uh, right, I'll let everybody know. No, uh, that'll that'll actually help me quite a bit. I'll be able to have two days off in a row, basically. Um, and it's not about having a day off, not writing. The writing part is fun for me. It's the being present and active in front of other people that can drain me, even if I'm not doing anything but writing. Yeah. So, um, I have every single day. I have I have awakened. And I've been like, I don't want to do anything like this past week. And then I get in here and I got great output. It never fails. My my worst enemy is my own fucking brain. Because I, I'd be like, it's the same way with exercise. Um, I didn't exercise for the longest time. And every, anytime I did, I felt great afterward. But then my body's just like, ah, no, you don't need to do all that. You're fine. You're not dying. You know, you don't need to lose weight. You're not sick because of your weight. Like, whatever. You like eating. Well, if I if if I'm going to continue eating like this, then I need to exercise. <laughs> That's a whole conversation I had with myself. I'm like, if I'm going to continue, and I've I've lost considerable amount of weight twice in my life. I was uh, 410 pounds. Uh, in fact, if you look up images of Edward Lorne, uh, w- one of the very first thing that pops up is me at my biggest. Uh, my 400 and uh, 410 pounds and I look at that picture and I'm like holy shit uh, so I dropped from that all the way down to 330 um, and that's when I started my YouTube channel then I got back up to 350 and now I am down to three I can't get under 300 to save my fucking life but I've lost another 50 pounds so I'm right at 300 and I can't it, I, all I want to see on the scale is 299 that's all I want to see I'll be happy but no that's just me bitching. Random. My wife, my wife uh, she lost, uh, I mean, she's not real big. She just, you know, she, we, we, she's had three kids. And um, so she maintained some of that baby weight for years and then um, tried vegetarian diet. And that helped a little bit and then did a keto diet and that's what did it. Yeah. So she's keto keto will, will melt it off of you. The only problem with me is my, I'm not in a good mental place if I don't have carbs because I associate pleasure. I I associate food with pleasure, not food, not fuel. So anytime I'm in a bad mood or whatever, I want to eat. And I'm usually in a pretty weird if not bad mental place so i'm always eating um no matter how good life is going there's always that little voice in the back of my head going oh yeah you know this is going badly over here off to the side that you're not paying attention to and then i hyper focus on that and i forget about all the good things and i end up binge eating um but uh yeah the <laughs> it's a it's a fucking struggle but keto is amazing um it, it'll it'll melt it off but not if you're addicted to food like if you if you just like eating for the joy of eating um, and you like a variety, especially the carb side of things. Yeah. 
at least that's been my experience um because i did for a week and i dropped some pounds but nothing nothing has worked better for me than intermittent fasting and fiber loads of fiber eat whatever the fuck i want and only eating whatever i want for a window of about four hours so um now i don't do true intermittent fasting because i have cream in my coffee every now and again um and then i might have a banana if i get hungry just to keep my focus up uh but for the most part i uh binge eat but i eat quite a considerable amount probably about two to three hundred uh no two to three thousand calories in a sitting um when my maintaining calories should be about 22 to 25 um and it also corresponds with when i take my gummy so i'll take my gummy about five o'clock and then i'll binge eat for four hours until i finally pass out um but i have actually lost weight doing this um i've lost uh I think the last 40 pounds is because I've been doing that. So other than the cream, my coffee and an occasional banana, I eat between five and nine and then I don't eat any more. Uh, I get up, have my coffee, just do the whole routine over again. But the way I work, it, it makes sense to do that. And that's why I tell everybody who wants to lose weight. You need a if you're going to do a diet diet at all. You need to be able to do it to where it already works with your schedule. Don't change your schedule to start a diet because that's first, it's, it takes 21 days to build a routine. So you're going to have three weeks of, you know, anger that you, you know, or whatever while you're getting used to it and adjusting to it. So it just naturally worked this way. And all I had to do was work during the day and not have time to eat. And that was pretty much my lifestyle anyways. Um, but I wasn't eating anywhere near enough fiber. Now I take a fiber supplement. I have berries. I have chia seeds, flax seeds, all that stuff. So damn near anything that comes, uh, this is TMI, everything that comes in goes out, you know, um, it's, and that's all, all our bodies are, you know, if, if you are, uh, if you live a stagnant lifestyle, but not stagnant, but se uh, sedentary, sedentary, thank you, uh, sedentary lifestyle, then you have to eat a little amount of food because there is that maintenance fuel, you know, that you need just to keep running. Um, but if you, if you're active, you can, of course, eat more. And, and it all depends on your lifestyle, but what, what you're doing. I'm never going to be skinny. I was fat when I was born. I was, I think, 11 pounds, 12 ounces. Uh, they had to cut me out and pull me out with a crane is how my mother, uh, they, they had to cut me and pull you out with a crane is what my mother used to say. Um, but I was huge, man. I mean, I was a, I was a big, chunky motherfucker. And I was, I was that way throughout my entire life. Um, so I'm always going to be big. I just don't have the, I don't have the metabolism. I don't have the genes. I don't have any of that stuff. I have to fight to lose weight. Even when I'm on, in a calorie deficit, um, my body just holds it. Um, and the, the whole point of keto as I'm, I know you're aware, but anybody who's watching, who cares? The whole point of keto is to make your body burn fat instead of sugar. So since our body turns carbohydrates into sugars, you cut out the carbohydrates and the only thing left over for your body to burn is the fats because the protein's going for other things, building muscle or whatever you might have you. Um, I've also fasted I, I, because I'm such a big dude. I've been able to fast for upwards of a month at a time and not feel a bit bad. Um, I felt like I had the flu like the first three days. They call it sugar flu or something like that. Um, and I was hungry, of course, but after those three days, I wasn't hungry at all. And that's what kickstarted this whole journey for me. And I'm not, this isn't advice for anybody, but this is what I did. Um, I just, I quit eating for a month and I was uh, just drinking water, literally no food for a month. Um, and I dropped, I think 30 pounds. Of course, most of that's just water weight. Uh, I dropped 30 pounds. Um, and then when I did come back and start eating, I only ate at night. And I've been doing that ever since. And I've kept the weight off. So um, everybody's going to be different. Everything is going to work differently for people. But I know personally that my weight loss journey, calling it that sounds funny, but my weight loss journey is all uh, was constantly uh, fucked up by routine, by having to change my regular routine to make this work. And the only way I found that it that it finally clicked was when I made the food routine match my daily routine. Uh, Tim, that's a, that's a that's a long answer. Uh, so let me ask 
uh, Chad, do you, you have anything you want to interject or say before? Because this is going to be another long answer, and I know I talk over you all the fucking time. So. <laughs> no. Sorry. You were trying to tell me about your wife, and here I was like, oh, I did keto. Uh, I'm, I only realize I'm doing it after I've done it. I apologize. It is not on purpose. It really isn't. It's just, it's me trying to solidarity. You know, it's like, oh, well, I have a story like that, too. So I'm sorry. Is there anything else you want to say? <laughs> no. Okay. So, Tim, the... Uh, the whole reason I started, the whole reason I did the 30 day fasting to begin with was because a doctor told me, and you know, I love a challenge. I've told all my viewers and every this, if, if you do not want me to read a book or if you want me to read a book, the best way to get me to read a book is to a not tell me to read it. Um, I have, I will do the exact opposite of what somebody tells me. So my doctor told me flat out. So the best way to get me to read a book is to tell me you hate it. That, that's honestly the best way. Um, and people do that to me. I know they use the reverse psychology um, because they've told me after I've read it. It's like I was hoping you were going to do that based on what I said. So um, but I went to the doctor. I was uh, 410 pounds at my heaviest, like I said. And I went to the doctor. The doctor was like the only since you're disabled, you can't exercise, you can't do anything. The only prayer you have at all is to have a gastric bypass. Now, to give a little more back history is I was working med surge at the hospital when I hurt my back to begin with. I worked there for five years. Um, we took care of 90 percent of the people that came through on the floor were gastric bypass surgeries. We had a 40 percent mortality rate. Let that sink in. Forty percent of the people who had this surgery died of complications or died because they didn't follow the rules after 40 percent. And that's not even high for gastric bypasses. Uh, we, we had a, so I took care of plenty of people who who either passed away on the floor due to complications. I went in one time, uh, and th this is I'm telling this story so that so that you 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 understand where my headspace was at. Um, it's a pretty gnarly story. So if you're grossed out by gore and stuff like that, I suggest you click away now. Um, I walked into this woman who had had a gastric bypass about six hours earlier that day. I came in an overnight. I walk in and I have to pull the covers back to get to her arm. And it's kind of dark because I don't go in flipping on lights like some nurses do. I came in to do vitals. So I pull back the sheet and my hand instantly warm and wet. So I flip on the overhead light and she's kind of coming awake in the bed. And I'm like, ma'am, are you Okay. Is I, the first thing I did when I noticed that my hand was covered in blood is I, I look up at her to make sure she's alive. And she's like, yeah, um, what, what's wrong? So I pull back the rest of the blanket. I automatically throw it back over there. I was like, I'm going to get the doctor because her staples had come undone. And her guts, everything on the that should have been on the inside was on the outside laying in her lap, laying on top of her in the bed. Um, and they, from what they could figure out, because she literally had a bloody finger and a staple off to the side, some in her sleep or whatever, she had worked one of the staples out and then the rest of them just kind of like a, you know, popping buttons on a shirt. You only really need to get the first one and the rest come really easy. The whole thing just popped right open. Um, so her guts were literally laying on the outside of her and she's, and she, she's like, she's scared just seeing my reaction because I couldn't help it. I'm like, I need to call the doctor. So she throws the blanket off, sees her guts sitting there and just starts screaming bloody murder, as you might imagine. Um, and on top of that, she looked dead when I first took cut on the lights. It was because she was so pale. She had lost so much blood and her eyes were fluttering open. So I don't even know if she like did it while she was awake, lost blood and passed out or what. I don't know. But uh, they were able to save her. But what what really stays in my mind anytime I think about a gastric bypass or stomach surgery is I remember that scene and I remember that that 40 percent mortality rate and all the people that I had to push down uh, to the to the coolers because we didn't have more. We had a cooler and then they would take people from the cooler to the actual uh, ME's office, which was across the street. Uh, that so those two things hit my hit, hit my head when my doctor told me the only chance you have is surgery 
So I was like, okay. So I started researching. There was a, a YouTube channel called The Fasting Fat Man who uh, was hyper fixated on this dude who didn't eat for a year and a half and managed to survive. And he was a super huge dude. He was like five, 600 pounds. And he just melted away to like 200 pounds over the course of a year and a half when all he did was drink water, eat nutritional yeast and have supplements. Um, so this fasting fat man, he's still on YouTube, but I think he's starting to gain his weight back now. He fasted for almost a year and I was following his journey and I'm like, I don't think I can do a year, but I'm going to try a week. I got through a week, had no problem. So I went a second week, third week, fourth week, and I did an entire 30 days before I decided, okay, I'm going to try eating something. And when I came back to it, I started with broth, then I went up to salads, um, and I just went back up to that point. My whole plan was when I came back, I told myself my stomach will be will have shrunk, and I will be able to eat as if I've already had a gastric bypass because eating too much is going to hurt because um, I'm not used to it anymore. Well, my body doesn't work like that. Uh, to give you a little more background on me, I used to be a professional eater, and I was really good. Um, I could eat upwards of 30 pounds of food in one sitting. Um, and it's my stomach would just expand, expand, expand. I'm also missing that gene or that pr whatever it is that tells you you're hungry. Um, it's uh, I, I'm missing that completely. So I can literally eat from morning all through the day and night. And that's how I used to eat. I used to eat like three or four buckets of chicken by myself. I'm talking fried chicken, like KFC and ch well, churches because churches had the $5 Wednesday deal. I'd go down and get two or three boxes of chicken and I would eat them by myself. Um, and I would eat candy bars by the, by the bag. Like I wouldn't buy just one candy bar. I would buy an, an entire bag of like the mini Snickers, eat the entire bag at one time and have like three or four, like 32 ounce glasses of milk while I was eating those. Um, yeah, the burrito, the, uh, my short story burrito is based on that. Um, and I used a lot of the, the stuff that I did, like the, the insane, uh, insanely hot uh, sushi challenge. Uh, I, I actually did that. Um, there was numerous uh, contests I won because I just couldn't get full. Uh, but then my teeth started going bad um, from all the drug use and, you know, just no maintenance over the years. It really hurts to brush my teeth. So I lost a considerable number of teeth. Um, and I still have nothing but shards up top, which is why you guys don't see me smile all big and wide for everybody. Um, but uh, uh, I, I couldn't eat like that anymore. I was literally breaking what little teeth I had left, trying to eat as fast as possible. So anyways, um, and that's how I got as big as I was at 410, because I would eat you know, 20 pounds of food during a competition and then I would go out for dessert afterward, um, even after eating that because I wanted something different. I still wanted to eat. Uh, but yeah, that's the, anyways, that's all my history. But that, that's that's the story. The doctor told me there's no way that you can lose weight without a gastric bypass. So I went out and I proved him wrong. That, that was or her wrong. Sorry. I went out and proved her wrong because that I wasn't I was not going to end up with my guts on the outside. And I was not end up because I knew if I ever had that surgery that I would start eating like that again when I got, when I got out there, there was no ifs, ands, buts about it because I would see people like me that would end up dying um, a couple of weeks down the road because they would eat and they would either bust their lap band or it would become shifted or they would have a uh, constipation to the point of they'd be uh, coffee ground emesis. If you know what that is, they'd be throwing up their, their own fecal matter. Uh, because, you know, it couldn't get past the point where it was supposed to. So it would just sit in their gut and rot. Um, I got horror stories for years uh, that I could tell you guys about gastric bypass. So th those two things kept me from doing it. And also, I am incredibly stubborn. Um, I, I don't know if it's the way I was raised or what. But the quickest way to get me to do something is to tell me not to do it. Or to tell me I only have one option. And I will find another option. I don't care if it's harder than your option. I will go out and I will find... The, another way to do what you don't want me to do. So that's a little bit of my mental health <laughs> or lack thereof. Anyways. <sighs> so you happy with this, Chad? Yeah, I am. Yeah, that's good. 
Yeah, it makes us to get, like I said earlier, it makes us to get out of this house and mm -hmm. and uh, away from these people. I literally can't take any more, man. I can't. Like, I was reading that section where the, the grunting and everything, and I was like, I don't want to, I don't know. I, I'm scrolling. Fuck this. No, I'm, I'm done with these people. So I'm right there with you. And if we hate them that badly, this is going to be, this, this is going to be affecting literature. So to be as pompous as I, to be as pretentious as I possibly can, this is going to be affecting literature. So, yeah. Mm. But yeah, I'm having a blast. Uh, the only thing that I'm tentative about uh, that I'm sitting here, I'm like, Let me say this right. I feel like I'm double working you with every chapter that I write because I know you're going to change it quite a bit. And I know you want to get going and move ahead, but it, it feels like I'm slowing you down. So it, 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 if, if that is the case, we need to figure out something to change that because I'm not cool with that. Um, I want you to be able to do more than just. I don't really see this slowing me down. I'm a, as you can tell, I'm a, slow writer anyway you know i can probably pull off m max maybe 900 words in an hour if i'm if i'm totally focused unless it's dialogue then i can if it's dialogue for some reason i could that has me the most focused and i can uh I, I enjoy doing that and um yeah but coming up with you know descriptive things and how are they feeling right now what's in the room Oh, that's right. They already, like I had earlier there, I was like, dude pulls a cigarette from his camel box or his pack of camels. And I'm like, wait a minute. He's, I think he's already smoking, you know? So, um, but yeah, it takes me, um, and I just have the tendency to, uh, um, uh, not really just write it out, but I have to kind of feel it so that I can, mm -hmm. Like, what would this person really say? How would they really, really feel in this thing? Rather than, like, I think a lot of stuff that's written, even in popular film, um, a lot of stuff is, like, it's not written authentically. It's written... Um, to, I, I, know, I, I think, let me see if I get where you're coming from. It is all purposely to drive the plot forward. There's no, like, emotion no. to it. No, that's no, not like, it. Like, you react... Yeah. Like uh, instead of giving somebody an authentic reaction, I, I don't feel I feel like a lot of writers compare uh, what they're writing to something that they've seen before, like a movie rather than an authentic reaction. And I've given this example many times before, but I don't know if we've talked about it. The movie Hereditary, the most disturbing part for me in that movie was when you've seen it, right? I oh, yeah, I, I fucking, yeah, it's one okay. of my favorite movies now. Well, with the kid, spoiler for anybody who hasn't seen it, um, there is that when the kid accidentally kills the sister, to me, his uh, his entire reaction from the second it happens till the next day is that's a real reaction to me. Yeah. But Nailed I think a, yep. in the wrong hands, somebody would write um, like it's like it's like on a subconscious level they would be like um how would this be in a in another movie rather right. than how would this be in real life but yeah that was why it, was, it messed me up so much because i was like i can this this kid's in shock he will not even look he's in, right. in complete denial yet he knows exactly what he just did yeah. exactly what, but he cannot bring himself whereas another writer would have him turning around and screaming and oh my gosh and it's like ah. You know that might happen, yeah, but what what happened with this kid? That's real. Mm -hmm. No, and I so, agree with you hundred percent. So when I write, I try to I try to think like that, like you know, instead of books I've read or movies I've seen, like how would this really? And unfortunately for me, I've had some pretty hardcore traumatic experiences to draw from. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are certain things that I could like what the kid went through that I can. Um, Put myself in those shoes and be like yeah I, I i i this is this is an authentic reaction so and that i think that part of it slows me down because there are certain things uh meaningful heartfelt things that i want to make sure that i get right rather than just um and you want to get there naturally too yeah yeah 
so yeah, I don't know. I've got a, I've got a big problem with, uh, um, non, whatever the word is, non-genuine uh, reactions that people have. And it's like, you, you don't know what you're doing. You just, you got this from watching a movie. You think that this is, yeah. you know. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, there's a lot of that kind of dialogue in South of here where people just react, you know, in, instead of like carrying on conversations, it'll be like a an awkward yeah. And then they'll be on to another topic. You know, mm -hmm. people, people, also people don't talk usually people that like like with me especially so i have a lot of people getting cut off in my dialogue because that's how it naturally happens in my head because i like this is where i would cut them off or this is where whatever i would interject my own feelings and thoughts people rarely talk in first in in full sentences like you know there's there's a it and the only way to really learn how people talk is to go out to a place maybe you're not comfortable being and watching people interact, um, if you're trying to write people that are that are uncomfortable to be around, especially like villains or whatnot, you go and watch, you know, go to a Waffle House at three o'clock in the morning on a Friday or Saturday and watch the junks, the drunks ramble in and hear the kind of crazy shit that they say. Um, or if you're trying to uh, build up an emotional scene that everybody has lost something uh, in, in their life. You know, whether it be a toy, a fucking animal, a family member, whatever. And that they teach us in acting classes also is that's what you draw. Um, again, I I harp on this a lot, but that's what they mean by write what you know. It's not, you know, don't do not write doctor stories if you're not a doctor. That's not what they're what they mean. Write what you know literally means to put your own experiences in it, but make it fit into the story naturally. You know, and and build off those things, especially for slice of life kind of things. Um, but the best way to learn how to write dialogue is to listen to people, to actually sit there and listen how they go from one conversation to another without a segue. How there's awkward silences, how they're and the awkward silence. You don't have to say that they sat in an awkward silence for so long. You can have people fidgeting with their fork or, uh, you know, keep picking up a, a glass, but not drinking from it, wiping the condensation off a glass, you know, putting, pulling a paper towel out from underneath the glass, putting it back down there, rattling, you know, just moving the food around on their plate. That's the kind of stuff that, that builds a scene and not you telling the reader that, and it's also how you lengthen your projects. If you're one of those people who's like, I could never write a novel sit down and learn how to write about shit that doesn't matter and make it interesting. Um, and how you do that is you take the point of the scene. You take what you would, what, what you would write normally. Like he sat there in awkward silence. How else can I say this to denote, to show that he, that it's now awkward and the silence is heavy and all that stuff. How would you do that? Now, if it's not all that important, then maybe, yeah, it's like the next couple minutes were awkward before I said, whatever. Um, but, if you're building a scene and you're building like tension or uncertainty or whatever, you really want to hyper focus on the affect their affectations, you know, their gestures and, and things like that. Um, I remember I got all that stuff, not from a writer, but just from life experiencing life experience, managing restaurants. Uh, because one of the things they hammered home was body language of your customer. Like if a customer is standing like this, with his arms crossed, say, as you know, over in the corner, and he's got an ugly expression on his face. You go out and you talk to him. You ask, know, "Are you doing all right? Everything okay?" You you read body language. You can tell so much without saying a word. What what is the saying? Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. It's true without the picture. You know, a a person's just the way they're standing can denote an emotion that can you know give give you an entire you know paragraph of what you know that character thinks is going on just by the way they're standing there and you don't have to say the customer was pissed they the guy stood over there with his arms crossed uh looking like he'd smelled the worst shit ever or whatever you know and anything like that um and i think that's what the beauty of chad is that he can do that shit first try i don't do any of that shit first try i am all i am i basically write these books like scripts i will be like the the room was cold he got up and walked across the room. He reached into the drawer. That's how my 
rough drafts usually go. And then later on, I will take out all that by rote nonsense and I will go in there and I will fill, fill it with emotion so that we're dealing with the characters' emotions and reactions to things other than by descriptions of the actions that they are doing. That's how I do it anyways. Chad seems to do it as he's going. <laughs> yeah, which I don't, I don't really prefer, but I can't stop doing that. I'd and rather just get it out, get that sense of accomplishment that, you know, the book is done mm -hmm. or, or that, you know, uh, because um, that's the hardest part is just getting, you know, getting the whole thing out. And then once you have it done, you're really motivated to go run through that next draft. But yeah. So for me, you know, with it taking so long to get there, um, it's kind of a drag. I just, uh, I just word vomit. That's literally what I do. And Chad's dealing with that now. That's why I kind of feel bad because Chad's dealing with my word vomit. Just me. Like, okay, for instance, let me read you guys something. There's only three of you in here, but let me read you guys something that I have no idea what the fuck this means. None whatsoever. Like no one's cleaned up the dog shit by the time I got it, I get out of the shower. So that's the first order of business. I grab three plastic grocery bags from a bag of them. Rita keeps under the sink. I double up one and use the third as a makeshift glove. Rita's buzzing around the house, darting here and there, shooting outside, only to come back in a second later. She steps over me on my hands and knees, scooping poop, grumbling expletives as she meanders. You seen my cornbread? Says Rita. I don't know what the fuck the cornbread has to do with anything. That was just the first thing that popped into my head. I crane my neck to find she ain't talking to me. She has her head in the door of her room, speaking to whoever might be inside. She's picking at her right arm, really digging in. Bloody fingers pull away and rise to her face where she sniffs at the tips. She catches me staring and wags her red fingers at me. Did you see my cornbread? She asks me. What? Is you deaf now? Have you seen my cornbread? We, you, we don't have any cornbread. My voice raises at the end. Uh, rises, not raises. Rises at the end like I'm asking a question. You ain't never no help. And and then it just goes, it goes from there. Like, they're... I have absolutely nothing in mind for this fucking cornbread. Nothing. But I don't know what she's going to say. So I yeah. just, the first thing that pops into my head, I get it down and I move on. Um, and so many people, what what Chad does is amazing to me. Like, I can't, I can't do that. I have to have the entire picture full and done before I can go back and rewrite it to what he's been doing which is he's been going over stuff that I know in my head needs to be rewritten. And he's already rewriting it and making it short, shorter, succinct, um, getting to the point quicker, getting rid of most of the by rote uh, stuff. And that's just like the rundown, the listicles, as I call them. It's like he walked into the room, he sat down, he did this, you know, that kind of thing that's boring to read. And Chad's been doing, if you guys haven't seen it, is Chad has been going and changing all of that to keep everything in the moment, to keep, to get the pertinent details out and move the fuck along. And he's also going back and changing stuff because we're two different minds and we're seeing things two different ways. So he's going back and blending them together. And I've given him free reign to do so because I know how I write to begin with. I know that I'm probably going to go back. I would have to go back and rewrite the entire chapter. And now I don't have to do that because Chad's got it. Um, and I'm, but I'm still going to go back and read and write and, you know, put maybe some more spins on certain things and whatnot, but I don't do that until the project, the rough draft is done. So, and that might annoy Chad when we get there to the end, but hopefully you bear with me because that's my process. And it probably isn't, honestly, it's not going to change much because I've been going through and reading everything you've changed and I've been like, mm, okay, yeah. That's that's much better. You got to the point quicker. You, you've done everything. I've had no problem with anything Chad has rewritten um, or written. So I'm 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 in awe as far as that's concerned. Uh, it is going to be interesting because once I get done with Chad, I'm going to be working with Derek Jones, who's a longtime member of the channel, uh, and he's never written anything. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be working with him through a brand new first pass of a of a book, collaborating mm -hmm. together. And that way I can show people who might not have written anything because me and me and Chad have experience at this point. You know, we, we're, we both know what we're doing here. Um, and to work with someone that has no idea to go from working with Chad to Derek. And the important thing that I'm looking at when I go to work with Derek is not 
imparting on him my style. So I need to let him be him and let him do find his own style. And if I find him mimicking me, I'm going to be like, okay, we need, we need to slow down. We need to work on this because you do need to work on your own style also. You know, don't don't go in this purposefully trying to mimic me. Find your style and then we will go back and blend everything together. So write like you want to, that kind of thing. And it might not happen. I don't know. It might not. But it's going to be interesting working with someone who's never done this at all. Um, I've, That's I've cool that you're doing that. I could never do something like that. I, I would have no interest. I yeah. I, I would I, like, I, I like to collaborate with either somebody who's on the same playing field or... <laughs> Way, or way above me so that I can, you know, learn and they, uh, but uh, I, I would never want to be in a position. I've been in the position one time where I had to carry somebody and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't very fun. It was just for a short story and it was my See, first collaboration, but. But, but that's, that's the point to make sure that I don't have to, to carry him. Like it, I, I find stuff like that engaging, challenging, motivating even to work with someone and not be the crutch to specifically go into it saying look you're gonna have to pull your own your your own weight over here and i'm gonna show you how um so that that's what interests me about the whole thing is not molding someone like a mentor kind of deal but to force someone to be good to force someone to find their own style and learn on their own at their own pace their own time and to make mistakes publicly um, you you got to be willing to make those mistakes uh, and to to that we're going to be doing this the same way we're doing it. So everyone's going to see his mistakes right off right off the jump. It's going to be bad grammar, all different kinds. I'm, I'm fully prepared for all that. But uh, at the same time, giving a safe space to do that, where if people come in here, you know, picking on grammar or whatever, I'm going to get rid of them. Um, because at the same time, people need to realize that this is a very individual task. Even though we're writing together, we're not writing the same thing at the same time. So it is you, you got to be comfortable being alone for long periods of time. You got to be comfortable uh, writing the worst you have ever written and knowing that this is all practice until you publish. Um, the, it's, it's important for, for writers, if the people who want to be writers who have never written, to understand that this shit does not happen overnight. And I'm not, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but just anybody watching um, is that you're going to be bad, but that's, that's the point. You, you, you fuck up, you learn from your mistakes, you grow and you move on. Um, and Keelan Patrick Burke said it the best. And I've been using it ever since he said it, but I've always been like this, even though I didn't say it like, I didn't think it like he said it. Um, and he said, if you are happy with the last book you wrote while writing the book that you're now writing, you're not growing. Uh, so you are also going to be, you're going to look back into the past and be like, okay, I could do that so much better. But you also have to learn to let that thing be what that thing is. At that time in your life, leave it alone and move forward. As, as much as people like, you know, watching remakes and all that other stuff, most people like also, also like not most people there are people out there like me that like watching the evolution of an author um and that's why i go from like the first book all the way to the last book if i find an author that i like i will read the first one all the way to the newest one because i like seeing how that author has grown over time and if there's no growth i give up on it. it's like i don't want to read the same thing over and over and over again um and that's why i like people like john Connolly and uh let's see here who's another um well, John Connolly's the perfect, he's like 20, 21 books into his Charlie Parker series. And every single one of them, he does something different. He has grown as an author, uh, even though they're all pretty formulaic as far as length and what happens. Uh, he is, he's done some experimental stuff in there. And I, lo I love seeing that. But just know anyone out there who wants to get into this, you are going to be bad at the beginning. If you think that you have a gift, even if you do have a gift and you're a natural storyteller, you are going to hit speed bumps. You are going to make mistakes. It is okay. Learn from them and move the fuck on. And most importantly, shut the fuck up and write. All the complaining on Twitter that I see or that I used to see, I don't have time to write. But yet I see nine. I see you got a 92 tweet thread about how you don't have time to do anything else. 
You could literally be writing while you're bitching on Twitter. My my buddy Jason Caval, you know Jason Cavallero. Uh, no. Right, <clears throat> he writes reviews for Horror Drive In. His Twitter handle is uh, Pawn or uh, Pinhead Spawn. Or oh yes, I do. I, yeah, right. we were gonna. Sorry, I didn't know his real name. Um, he was gonna do a drum track for for a project I was working on. Anyways, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we were actually actually uh, we had um started i had written a song recorded and then i uh, recorded everything vocals all that stuff and then uh <clears throat> i recorded a, a drum track um that had that i, I i'm not good with drums uh on the uh garage band drums mm -hmm. so a lot of it was just trial and error and a lot of happy accidents <laughs> by the time i got done with it because he was supposed to play drums on it and he did send me a couple different versions of it but by the time i got done with doing the drums i was just like you know what i'm really I'm happy with this but eventually we're going to do something else but yeah i cool. love jason he's a great guy and he reads he I, the dude reads like 200 250 books a year yeah i know and, <clears throat> and I, I, asked him, I asked him how and he said um well for starters i don't watch tv yeah and so it made me think it's like yeah we we our lives are really you know it's like, yeah, we're all busy, but there are some things that if you eliminate it, you'd probably be surprised at how much more free time you have, whether it be yeah. watching TV, YouTube, uh, Insta you know, just browsing on social media. There's a there's a couple notes to that, a couple of additions, if you will. Um, we, we get we as authors and creative people in general get stuck on the process and technicalities. Um, and I, I love highlighting a couple different things. Um, first off, uh, J.K. Rowling, as much as she's hated right now for whatever, J.K. Rowling wrote the entire first Harry Potter book on napkins with a pen. She would go to a coffee shop. She was homeless at the time, had a child. She would go to coffee shops, sit there and use the napkins out of the napkin dispenser to write Harry Potter and uh, whatever that first one is, the Philosopher's Stone or whatever. Um she wrote that on napkins. Uh, I tell same people to tell this, this is the same story that I tell people who want to start a YouTube channel. I was like, if you have a phone and a camera and you, even if you can only upload at 140 P you can still start that way. Uh, it does not take a writing laptop or a, a desktop or even a pen and actual ruled paper. John Irving to this day writes 800 page novels on printer paper. Like just Brian, Brian Boyer writes novels on his telephone. They, there you go. So does my buddy Linton Bowers. Um, so it, that, that's what I'm getting at. There is no there is no standard way of doing this. There's standard ways to submit. So you would eventually have to put it into Word or, or print it out in certain format or whatever. That's getting more lax nowadays um, uh, than it used to be. But uh, for the most part, write wherever, whenever you can. Caroline Kepnes wrote the, the first you book completely on her lunch breaks. 100% on her lunch breaks, didn't do any work. She didn't have time any other time. She was working so much. Uh, so you got Rowling, who did it all on napkins, was rejected 300 and some odd times before she finally found a publisher. That's another inspiring ass story. Uh, same with King and Carrie. It got rejected multiple times. And he just kept them on his on one of those spikes that you put on your desk and like a, what is it? Like receipt spike or whatever that you see. On, on his, on his wall actually. Oh yeah. On his, I'm sorry. On the wall. He had them all <laughs> on a spike. Um, but anyways, so you're going to get rejected. Uh, you, you don't need to wait until you have a viable option to write, write and read whenever the mood strikes you. Um, unless of course you were like in the middle of work, but if you, any, any time that you have, and we all make sacrifices for the things that we love. If you're not willing to make the sacrifice to give yourself time to write or make time for yourself to write, then it's not that important to you. And I would say maybe take up knitting or another hobby. <laughs> That's I, 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 people call me cruel for saying that, but this isn't for everyone. This is a very lonely job. Uh, you spend hours and hours by yourself questioning yourself. And that's where imposter syndrome and the mythological writer's block. Writer's block is a thing you do to yourself. 
I have never suffered from writer's block. I don't know if Chad has. Some days no, words come believe. harder. Sure. And you said, no, no, you don't? Yeah, I don't believe in writer's block. Right, exactly. Me, neither do I. Writer's block is a construction of your own brain. It is, it is you telling yourself that there's a reason why you can't come up with the words today. And when those things happen, that doesn't mean don't write. What that means is you, you, you write and then you fix it later. You know, and if you were completely burned out, then yeah, maybe take a break. But if you're just sitting there stuck on one line that you can't get right, that's where your writer's block comes from. You know, your, your writer blocks come, your writer's block comes from a place of insecurity. You're like, I can't do this. I can't. There is no can't in writing, period. I've, I've said this my entire career. There is no can't. You can do whatever the fuck you want. You can write however you want to. And as long as you get that done, eventually you're a writer. OK, well, you're a writer anyways, even if you don't get it done. But it's it's there's something to be said about the completion of a project. That's why I say don't share, share your here. I am streaming us writing. Don't share your unfinished products with anyone. Uh, don't uh, let anyone read because you want to know if it's any good. Uh, what you do is you finish it and then you you take it to people. And then you work on it. You, you don't don't be like, hey, will you read the first 10 pages of my book? I always tell everyone no. Um, there's a couple reasons. But the main reason is you shouldn't kill your momentum because you're in your own head. You are the one fucking this up. Stop it. <laughs> just just finish. Just finish the work. And some people are like that's easier said than done. Not everybody's head works like yours does. It's like writer's block is a construction. It is not real. It is it is something that. Uh, uh, an author who couldn't get past a roadblock in their work came up with said, I'm blocked. I can't think of anything else. And you know what they're not doing at that time? They are not writing it out. They're sitting around thinking about this fictional thing, this writer's block. Um, and I, I do know that the, the only people that I've ever seen suffer from writer's block are people who probably shouldn't be writing. I know that sounds terrible, but that that is the truth, because most of the natural storytellers that I, I have met have never once had an issue with an idea. You know, never. There's always something. And even when there isn't something, they have so much life experience to draw off of. Um, and yeah, anyways, but what, what I'm saying is if you got people out there publishing books at 15, 16 years old with no life experience, you can think of something to write, <laughs> even if it is just a fictionalized version of your own life, like I did with Day's End or, or Chad's done with numerous ones, uh, numerous books of his, where it's just your life fictionalized and made, you know, all that much more extra uh, so that it's entertaining to read. <clears throat> But yeah, sacrifice, 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 even sacrifice while you're writing. Kill your darlings. Uh, if you have what you think is the best line that's ever been written, delete it at least once. <laughs> if it's good enough, it'll it'll stay. But these are just little things that I've I've done myself. And I, I don't actually suggest you do that. But um, because I've literally made an I've went back and rewritten an entire book because of the last paragraph of a book. The last paragraph I wrote made everything I, I wrote before that obsolete, but I literally rewrote the entire book to make that final chap that final paragraph work because it changed the entire book, the themes and everything into something so much better. So I went back and rewrote that entire book. And sometimes that's what it takes. One good line will send you on a journey of a thousand miles um, and focusing, especially focusing on character. Well, if you're looking to lengthen your stuff, focus on your characters more, because usually what happens with stuff uh, when you're when you're stuck on lengthening your stuff, you're only writing the action and the pertinent details. So everybody likes a little slice of life every now and again. Um, if not, literary fiction wouldn't be a thing because that's all slice of life and themes. Um, and then, you know, and then once once you've built up that character, then bring in the drama, then bring in the action, then bring in all that stuff. But uh, anyways. That's that's my I'm I'm gonna step down off my soapbox now. <laughs> that's 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 my that's more than two cents. That was about a buck and a quarter. But anyways. Yeah, I'm I'm a big uh, believer in in it's it's sad, but yeah, the first thing that you that you write is you're gonna hate it uh, one day, 
and I my the first book I released is Foster Homes and Flies. I haven't gone back and read it, but uh, according to reviews, it still holds up, and I and I, I I've read it enough times to still be proud of it. But before that, I had released a collection, and in that collection was a story that. I wrote uh, author notes in, for each story too. And for one story in particular, um, I said that this would this was my favorite story, short story I've ever written and it probably always will be. Mm. Uh, this was in 2014, I think. Uh, that's not even in my top 40, <laughs> short, 40 short story, best short stories I've written. Yeah. And uh, I don't even like that collection. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's horrible. It's just not, you'll never see me talking about it. It still sells a little bit, but I, I never advertise it, never promote it. Uh, I did ex, I did do a, uh, a revised and expanded edition where I um, went through every single story and I I used Lutsky 2.0 to, to go through and, I like that. you know, make them uh, a little leaner, tighter. And then I added like two or three short stories that were more about what I am, you know, today. So I don't, I don't hate it, but um, yeah, it's kind of funny looking at back. There's so many of these stories I just can't stand, and they, they just feel like filler to me. Yeah. Um, to, to build off of that, and just to agree with you, uh, when I got done writing Bay's End, uh, it was the first book under the Lorne name. I had been published numerous times before, traditionally even small press, some, some indie stuff that went nowhere. Um, when I got done with Bay's End, I was like, this is the best thing I've ever written. Everybody's going to love it. Um, got it edited, put it out. It, excellent, excellent it, book, by the way. Yes. Thank you. Um, and everybody, it, it, was such a, it was such a warm reception for the first Lauren story. Um, and then um, it, I, I got to, I think, uh, uh, years, uh, uh, like a year or two went by. And I had written a couple more books since then. And nowadays, I consider that my worst book. And then you have people like Chad who's like, it's a really good book. You know, um, books are going to mean different things to different people. Just because you don't like something does not mean that just because you look back on something and think that it's bad does not mean that you're not going to find fans for that. That people still don't. Not accurately, honestly, love it is what I'm getting at. So Chad can tell me great book. He loves it. Whatever. Same with South here. Great book. He loves it. Um, but I know just personally that I've grown since then. But I also I also have to constantly remind myself that he's being honest with me. You know, he he likes these things, even though I've moved on and I've grown or, or, or what have you. Um, and I look back like I still feel to this day that Bay's End is the worst thing I've ever done. But I'm also now reminding myself if that's the worst thing I've ever written and published. That ain't too fucking bad. You know, mm -hmm. if that's the, if that's the worst if that's the worst of my output, I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm doing really well. And uh, I, I do love the Lorne uh, character arc of every single book feeling different than the last one. Um, even the stuff that was in the Bay's End series, are, they're all written differently. Um, there's a different, because I grew with each and every book. And then you have the offshoots uh, that don't tie into that at all, that story at all, um, that are wildly wildly different like south of here reads nothing like anything else lauren has out there period um and I, I i love that and that's kind of why i was happy with just letting him die because you go from bay's end to south of here south of here being the last publication um and there is such a huge growth in just those 10 years that i was perfectly fine letting letting him go um because I didn't think I could get any better than South of here. You know, I, it was, a, it was a, it not come full circle, but it, it was just constant growth. And if people got used to, and that's another reason why South of here is, I don't really promote it all that much. And it just kind of sits there first off because it's offensive as fuck. It's not for everybody. And, I have, and I've somehow gotten lucky so far where the majority of people like it. Um, I haven't got a single negative review for it yet, which blows my mind. But, uh, it, it felt like the perfect place to end because it was just as obscure and everything as, as the point where I started. So even though I got, I got good <laughs> using dark soul speak, I got good during that entire time. It was still, 
I started with a very down to earth, realistic story. And I ended with a down to earth, realistic story. But if you read Bay's End and South of here back to back, it's two completely different authors. Um, there, there's absolutely nothing in Bay's End that you're going to find in South of here and vice versa. Um, so while I still ended start, I still started and ended my career with the same kind of small story. There's so much growth in between there um, that I'm I'm just proud of the whole character arc. You know, I just I, I like Lorne being the, the the author that he was, mm -hmm. and now moving on to my what I'm calling my John Irving era. That was my Stephen King era. Now moving on to my John Irving era, what it, where it's all family saga stuff, like you know these long epic stories that take place over the course of, you know, 50 to 100 years. And that's the kind of thing that's really drawing me right now because nobody's really doing that outside of the literary fiction, you know, genre. They're doing the, the most of the stories are very tight stories in very confined places. Um, and the only place you're finding stuff different than that, like I said, is literary fiction. Like Cloud Cuckoo Land takes place 500, the, the chapters jump back and forth 500 years apart. And that, stuff like that interests me. You know, stuff that's just wildly, wildly structured. Um, I'm also a big fan right now of no structure whatsoever, uh, where it's just, you know, you're just experiencing a story. Anyways, but th that's how much we change. That's that's my point there. We change a lot. And if you look back on your stuff and you're like, that book sucks, it's fine because you're still the but you need to believe the people who tell you that they enjoy it. You do not need to look down on them or think anything bad of them. They are enjoying the story for what it is. And, I mean, they, and don't get don't get down on yourself too. If if the book that you love isn't the book that everybody else loves, because you'd be surprised at how many Wallflower is. I did did not ex expect still to this day uh, the reception I've got for the, first of all the shortest book that I wrote. Um, with probably the bleakest ending and the most uh unoriginal out of all of the ones that i've written i feel like flower wallflower that story's been told before yeah. you know basketball diaries i mean dude starts drugs can get off drugs what oh. whatever you know it's, yeah. it's been done a million times mm -hmm. but man and and the, the emails still that i that i get uh you know everything from you know this is this has helped me stay sober or, mm -hmm. or to consider this, or this helped me re reconcile with my junkie brother. We haven't talked for 10 years. I read this book and we just sat down with a family and I showed him this book and we were, and it's like, dang, man. I, and it's like, I, all I was really trying to do was I was, uh, Mark Matthews was putting together one of his anthologies. I think it was the first one that he did his drug books that he mm -hmm. did. Cause he's like a drug counselor. And he's he's been in the uh, the program for years, so he likes that like drug horror. I was writing it for that. I was wondering why he was. It seemed like he was obsessed with that thing, and that, that that's not a slight. I just noticed that a lot of his stuff had that in there. I don't he, even though we've been in an anthology together, I I've had no contact with him. So, but he he gave me he he lengthened my deadline because I had some revisions I had to make, and I thought for sure my my story is going in here. And uh, he rejected it. And um, I was like, and he said, it needs this or something like that. So I was like, all right, man. Well, thanks for, I appreciate the, the extension. Yeah. But I'm telling you right now, you're going to wish you'd put that book in there. And I was jo I was joking with him. Yeah. You know? I said, this is going to be the one that got away, Mark. And he's like, you're probably right. So I, I revised it and um, more and added something. I can't even remember what I did to change it. But uh I'm I'm thankful. I'm so grateful that that book didn't get put in there because uh, collections don't sell well, and it would just be a book stuck in a collection. One of the my the saddest things I've ever written, uh, the strangest twist upon her lips, is a novella that's stuck in an anthology with with uh, um, Bob Ford and John Bowden, the, the Crystal Lake books that have been coming out with like the three authors. Mm -hmm. which is really cool. I was grateful to be invited. I'm thankful it's out. I'm proud of all three stories, all three novellas. But at the same time, it's like nobody's really read that. Yeah. And it drives me crazy. And uh, I mean, when I get the rights, I'll probably release it myself, put a cover on it, and uh, yeah. got another Lusky novel. That, uh, I'm, I'm pissed off at you because that title alone should have been a standalone. 
it should i didn't even know it fucking existed yet i remember talking to you a long time ago and you talking about it and me absolutely loving that fucking title and now i'm mad at you like i'm <laughs> i'm legitimately mad at you because it not only is it out there and i haven't read it but it's also stuck in there and i got nothing against ford or Bowden, but and it's stuck in there with them not getting the the release it deserves yeah i'm mad i'm mad well it's the, all like i said all every story in there is is very good um bob bob and my story and bob's story are closer in relation and they overlap with each other with some of the characters yeah uh john's isn't quite like that so it's kind of like a um so ours is kind of seamless where his is kind of like the outlier but it's still beautifully written and very very eerie yeah. where ours is more like well mine's just straight up real life yeah <clears throat> and then um mine mine you you've seen uh love liza before oh, i love yeah that's one of my yeah. favorite movies of all time that's what this is my love liza nice this this God is a, yeah guy guy's fiance kills herself <laughs> he can't bring himself to read this letter yeah. So he tackles a bucket bucket list that they had created while they were both doing heroin, and it's oh, full so of good. full of some strange so stuff. So he just goes out and tackles this bucket list, and then and then it gets real sad. Let Let me say something before we move on, or before we leave, uh, about Wallflower. So um, I, for those of you that don't know, I was an addict uh, on heroin from '97 to 2001, um, and one of the first things I said when I finished reading Wallflower was, oh, Lutsky is obviously a heroin addict. You know, either either he's a he either he's a former junkie or he's a current junkie or whatever. Um, and I think that's one of the very first conversations we ever had was me asking you if at least that's how my mind remembers it, uh, asking you if, you know, or how long were you on heroin or whatever? Because I just yeah. assumed it was so well written that uh, the only thing that that is above it in your catalog for me is skull face boy um i have i have a very close relationship with skull face boy because it reminds me so much of my child my childhood just kind of being off on my own a lot of the time not even friends just going from place to place even if it was just in my town there was a lot in my town because i lived basically in an annex of la so i could walk for you know two miles and be in a completely different area like I could go to the hood one way. Actually, I live in the hood. I could stay in the hood. I could go to, you know, the, I could go to West Hollywood. I could go to fucking uh, Hollywood. I could go to Los Angeles proper. I, so many different North Northridge was a bit long farther away, but I could, I could get there. Um, and I traveled all over the place. And it, so it felt, it, I'm just, I'm biased. Uh, have you written better things since then? Maybe, I don't know, but I'm, I'm biased with that one. That's my favorite. But Wallflower is a close second, but I would never reread. I've read I've read Skullface Boy like three or four times by now. But uh, with Wallflower, I'll never read that again. Because he got it so right that it was triggering for me. It took me, what is it, like 100 pages, 120 pages? Yeah, right? it's, I, sure. it's, it, like, it's like It's like, it's like 18,000 words. Yeah, so. It's very short. I read it in a sitting, blew right through it. Um, no, no, I didn't. Sorry. Skull Face Boy was the one I read in the city. Uh, Wallflower took me like three or four days uh, to read that much of it because I kept having to put it down because every single scene reminded me of something horrible that had happened to me. And the, of course, the way it ends, I'm a huge fan of bleak endings. So the way it ends, I'm just like, fuck this book. Fuck <laughs> this book. Fuck Chad Lutsky. I don't ever want to read this shit again. But I couldn't lie and be like, you know, this isn't powerful fiction. It's a, it were just powerful story period um, because it was so realistic. And I, I, I think I asked you, you said you got most of your information from message boards or yeah, on, I, online stuff. Yeah. There's a message. There was a message board where um, people were, uh, they were romanticizing it and they were, they were giving tips like, don't use this brand of tinfoil. It's bad for your lungs. Use this brand of tinfoil. And I'm like, are you guys listening to yourself right now? Yeah. And then I watched lots of videos of people nodding off and mm -hmm. read lots of descriptions of, of what it, you know, what it feels like and stuff. But yeah, a lot of message board stuff. I, I love uh, like the best worst description of what heroin feels like is what Quentin Tarantino told John Travolta. He said, get a fifth of whiskey, a fifth of tequila, drink the entire thing and then go float in a pool. Um, 
And that's what heroin feels like. That is the best worst description that I have ever heard anyone put. And why, why I mean the best worst description is because it doesn't feel anything like that because when you're drunk, you kind of, you kind of realize that this situation might be dangerous kind of, kind of deal. But when you're on heroin, you do not know danger. There, mm-hmm. there is no danger. You can, you can fall asleep in the middle of a fucking road. And now while I've, I've seen drunk people do about the same thing that I, I had far more self-awareness drunk off of an entire K, a 24 pack of beer than I ever had with just a little amount of heroin. Um, it, it completely numbs you. There is, there is nothing to be felt that you go to a completely different place. Uh, there, there is no reality. Reality doesn't feel real. And wherever you are is a good place to sleep. And I never had that happen with me when I drunk. I blacked out places. But the thing about heroin is you'll, you'll nod off and you'll still be aware of everything that's going on, but it's kind of like a surreal dreamlike thing that's going on. Like you'll hear voices and those voices will stick to you. Um, you'll, of, of course, there's always the waking up instantaneous withdrawals uh, when you wake up. For some odd reason, no matter how long you sleep, it can be five minutes since your last hit. Falling asleep kind of, it, it sucks because the more you do, the more you nod off. And the less you enjoy it, that's why they call it chasing the dragon. You never get that initial high again. Um, and you'll, but you want, you want that high. So you take more and you take more and you take more. And the more you take, the more you're on the precipice of literally on the precipice of death. You know, your, your breathing slows down your mind, kind of, your, even your vision tunnels uh, because your body literally cannot process what is, what is happening. Uh, and it's shutting everything down. So every time you see someone nodding off, there's a very good chance they're dying. Uh, but uh, and usually what you end up dying from, though, is like choking on your own vomit because you get that swirly sensation. And if you you try you try not to black out right away because, you know, if you do, you're going to end up getting sick. Uh, there, there's just so much there's so much unspoken stuff with heroin addiction. Um, but you got all, all the pertinent details. Right. And it was yeah, it was still to this day. I remember yeah, you know, I could like see the wallpaper on the wall. I could see the needle. I could every everything was so well done, um, and that same defeatist nature that you finally are just like fuck it. This is my life now, you know. Because regular life does not feel anywhere near as good as this. Um, so yeah, hundred percent. That book fucks me up. I will never read it again. Um, it's uh, not something that I enjoyed reading, but it is powerful as hell. Um, and it is the closest thing I have ever read from someone who has not done the drug. And so that's very impressive. Whether you well, looked, you. whether you looked up upon it or you, you did your due diligence, whatever it might have been, because there's people who research this shit for years and still get shit wrong. Well, to, to, be, to be fair, you know, I, I, I'm no stranger to addiction myself and, yeah. and though I've been in recovery for years. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the, the lies that, um, Oh, yeah. And how you can manipulate yourself, just like with, with uh, uh, can't remember his name, Christopher or something in the book. Um, <clears throat> well, well, I only tried this kind of hair when I guess it's bad. I need to, I haven't tried the real thing yet. So I'm going to, you know, and I still haven't got it. Well, I'm going to try the real thing now. And then, oh, this guy says that, you know, and then just that, you know, I'll stop tomorrow and all that kind of stuff. And, and just, uh, you're just, uh, you're, you're chipping away at this thin ice. Uh, and you're you're knowing it. You know you the whole time. You're just deep down. You're making excuses. Yeah. Um, a lot of the Broad Street Bastard deals with a lot of that because Jex is is in the middle of his twelve step program. He's trying to, um, but he's he knows he's taking steps toward relapse. Yeah. The uh, the thing another thing is no that nobody ever talks about the reason why addicts promise that they're going to get clean is because we associate the high with how we want to be, with how things should be. Um, we think that while we're high that, Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm in a good mood. You know, this, this is, this is the way I should be. You know, people deserve to be happy, you know, and I'm, and I'm happy and I feel tremendous. You know, my inner thoughts aren't kicking my ass. So I'm going to give this thing up. So we make all these promises when we're in a good place 
And then when we come out of that good place and we don't have the drugs for a little while, we're right back to going, it can't be that bad. If I feel so good while I'm on them, at least for me, I guess I shouldn't talk for all addicts, but at least for me, that's what it was. It was when I was high, I was in a good mood. So I didn't make promises as much as I really wanted to do it. You know, I really, truly didn't want to have to do this stuff to be happy. But I see is affecting my family. It was, you know, whatever it might have been. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, well, if I can, f- I feel this good right now. If I can carry that feeling with me and remember this feeling while I'm sober. But the thing is, when you're sober, there is nothing on your mind except for that thing, except for whatever your addiction is. Um, and even to some extent with me, food. You know, there's nothing on my mind more after five o'clock in the afternoon than, you know, eating. That's that's what I want to do. That's my routine. That's when I'm happiest, when I'm sitting there eating. And I forget all about how much fun I had writing earlier in the day or how much I had fun I had making videos or whatever, or how I could continue to do those things and not eat myself to death. Um, none of that stuff crosses your mind. It's only about the addiction. It is 100 percent focus on that because that is what we that is what I convinced myself is my what should be my normal state of being. I'm broken. The drugs fix me. So the drugs are friend. If friend shaped is friend. <laughs> so anyways, but uh, yeah, all, all that to say, he did. He did a fantastic. You did a fantastic job with the book. Um, and I've never, ever, ever read one of your stories and thought, yeah, this wouldn't happen. Uh, I think you get, I think you just get humanity right, period. And that's what, <clears throat> that's what draws me. You, you know, like Haruki Minakami, and I, I've compared you to him before, and people have looked at me weird, but it's, it's getting the stuff that isn't talked about constantly right. Um, and like, like I was talking about yesterday with him winning the, the worst sex scene uh, mm-hmm. for, for that you know, for that sex scene taken completely out of context. No one writes awkward very well that I've found. Um, and no one writes it as well as he does. And that's why I compare you to, to Haruki Minikami, because you let your characters, if they're awkward, you let them be awkward. If they're, you know, whatever they are, they just are. You tell it plainly, kind of like Cormac McCarthy, too. You don't make a judgment call. You just say, this is how they are. And I'll show you some examples of how they are. And that's how they are. I don't agree with it or disagree with it. That's just how the fuck they are. And I wish more people would just allow their characters to be who they are instead of reminding us secretly in the novel or the book or short story that the author doesn't think that way. But the where we've come for, you know, in, in modern day, you have to, you, and I, I've had editors force me to add in something to make it obvious that that was the character's thought and not my thought. Um, and I hate that. If anybody reads South of here, you're not going to find any of that shit in South of here, which you're, you're just going to have people being people. Um, and you, and that lets the reader decide. But unfortunately reader, a, a lot of readers nowadays are going, okay, this person thinks this way because the author thinks this way. When, any good author is going to be able to either mimic someone they don't like or is going to be able to nail, you know, per- perfectly get right something that they don't like. And usually they get it right because they have focused so hard on not being that thing that we know all the signs, we know all the red flags, all the warnings, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know what to stay away from. But we know that the character doesn't know that. Yeah. So we will just throw all that stuff out there. And it's, it's funny because in, in South of here, I use the T word for, uh, for transsexual. I use the T word several times in the book, yet the character who is thinking the T word is attracted to transsexuals. So it is, it, it thinks there's nothing. I think there's one line is like nothing hotter than a chick with a dick. I, I think is what is what's said there. And that alone is offensive. You know, that's not something I would ever say in regular life. I don't use the T word. Obviously, I'm, I'm stepping around it now because my oldest is trans. But um, but on top of that, I, I never liked the word much anyways because it was a very dismissive. It, it's it's used as a slur. Uh, so but in the book, of 100 percent, the character would use that. 
the a hundred percent the the character would call a Hispanic person by the by the by the s s p slur. You know, there there's several things in there. Is like you 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 have to let the character be whoever the fuck the character is going to be, and if the reader is going to get stuck on something and think that that's the author, that's the reader's problem and not the author's problem. Um, I believe that wholeheartedly. And another thing, so here's some other writing advice. And Chad might honestly completely disagree with me here, so I'd love to hear what you have to say before we go. But if you write something and someone, whether it be a beta reader or if, it, if it's already published, a reader, if only one person understands something, you did not do anything wrong. If like 900 people completely missed the point, but one person did without your input, without you telling them and talking to them, one stranger got the point, that's those other readers' problems, not yours. Uh, if you get one thing right, that means you put enough information in there that it could be found. But the other people just chose to ignore it. So I don't know how you feel about that. I know a lot of authors are like accessibility, accessibility, accessibility. You need to make sure that as many people understand what you're getting at as possible. With me, I don't feel that way at all. Yeah, well, 900, I do agree, but 900 to one is a, it's a big number. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just like uh, with Skullface Boy, some people get that, okay, he's got a skull for a face. We don't know why. Let's go. They get that. You know, you don't need to know. It's not important. This is the story. Mm -hmm. And some people are like, well, how does he drink water? How does he, <laughs> you know, and it's like, just let it happen, man. You know, this yep. is a this is a world that's being created for you. Jump in the car and take a ride. We'd leave yeah. that. Let fiction be fiction. Who gives a fuck? How exactly? I never never once in that story did I even focus. I saw him, I saw Levi playing in my head uh with with the skull face. I didn't think about drinking, I didn't think about any of that shit. I was just there and down for the ride. Of course, I was also on a huge binge of bizarro fiction. I had just met Gregor Zane. And we, we'd become friends. And he wrote the, still to this day, I've never read anything as wild and professionally written as Gregor's stuff. Um, he reminds me very much like Jeff Vandermeer. Well, he will go to the wildest fucking places and take it seriously. I respect the hell out of that. It's not going to get him a huge fan base, but I respect the hell out of that. And he goes, um, he goes, have you, have you read any Chad Lutsky? And I'm like, no, um, I've seen him around in the community, but no, I haven't read anything. He's like, he's got this book called Skullface Boy. I said, what? He said, skull face boy. I said, does he have a skull for a face? He goes, fuck yeah, he does. I was like, okay, yeah. So I went out and I got it, fell in love with it. Right, I never once, and maybe it was because of the binging, but I would like to think, you know, I've, I've read it, you know, at least, at least three times so far. And every single time, never once do I question about the face. I just let it go. In fact, my favorite part is the part out behind, like, the the path that he follows out behind the house I, I think it's the what is it oh i don't want to give any spoilers but the uh, uh yeah I, I don't want to talk too much about it but anyways there's a, there's a thing where he walks out into like the woods and there's a stream or something oh with the, with the uh with chick who may or may not be a werewolf yes that, well yeah. i didn't want to say that but yes that's <laughs> That's it. I didn't want to say the W. I didn't want to say werewolf, but yeah. I'll let you spoil it. Anyways, um, so so that part, it's just it was that part is fucking magical, and I get excited every time I think about it because you, uh, I don't like it. once again. I don't want to give any spoilers, but that that scene, I will read that scene sometimes. Like when I'm walking by your books on my shelf because they're all together, I'll see Skullface because it's the thickest one out of the entire group, um, uh, even if Cannibal Creator is very close. And I'll just pick it up and I'll flip to that because I have I have the page marked and I'll just flip to that scene. And I'll just read that scene because it's just the way it unfolds and the mystery of it all. And it's still shocking, even though it's not like fully unveiled or whatever. Just that scene is brilliant. Um, and that's mm -hmm. one of the things that and that's why I I, caught, I when my review for it. Like this dude is like Haruki Mitakami because he will tell you something, give you enough information to figure it out on your own and then fuck off to another scene. And that that's my favorite type of, of story it is that now do do I do that in my own stuff? Like half the time, you know, I don't I, I usually hold hands because. But, well, at least 50 percent of the time I'll hold hands because and this is going to sound terrible because I know my audience. And I've seen how they reviewed certain things and certain things that they've completely missed. 
And that's why it was important for Salta here. I didn't do any fucking hand holding. Like I wanted to see how much I could get away with um, as far as how much I could leave off the page. Like the bloody panties. There's several different scenes that go absolutely nowhere that have a purpose in the book um, as, as warning signs for other things that are coming. Um, and just compl- and every single review says, I'm still trying to figure out the panties. <laughs> and I, I, I love that. But like two people have gotten it. Two people understand where I was going, what I was setting up. Um, and it was all character development for Tanya. Um, it was 100% all that. It, it, it didn't really go any farther. But I was setting up that she was not everything that James was seeing on the surface. So, right. But anyway. Uh, yeah. I really like these sessions, not only because we get our writing done and everything. And it's another thing to show, to show people that just because and we, we've gotten 2000 words done today, let's say 2000 words. And mm-hmm. we've still had time to shoot the shit. We have done our day's work. We have chatted. We have chat in between working yesterday. We did a huge like hour long discussion right in the middle and still ended up with like 1600 words. So what the point I'm getting at here at the end is you can find time to write. It doesn't have to be a whole hell of a lot, or it can be a whole hell of a lot. But manage your time, sacrifice something, maybe stay off Twitter for a day, and use all your words on your book instead. Um, but eventually, you'll be able to do it all. You'll be able to write, stop, do something else, come back, write some more, stop, do something else, come back, write some more. And it's that continuous process until you're done. That's it. And that's why a lot of writers quit is because it is the same process over and over and over. But what keeps us coming back is the new characters, the new stories, the new experiences, the new adventures. All of that stuff is what keeps you coming back. Um, and it, it's it's lonely as fuck out here. But every now and again, uh, it's uh, it can be a collaborative process. Uh, but for the most part, get used to being alone. Anyways. Facts. Facts. As the, as the kids say. Facts. No cap. That's a new one, too. Uh, that's probably the whitest I've ever said that 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 phrase, but no cap. Bet. Anyways. All right. So thank you guys for joining us. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Again, uh, whoever's left in here, I'm not sure. So I'm not going to say goodbye to anybody in particular. Uh, and I'm not even going to ask Chad this time if he has anything else to say at the end because he never does. So until next time. <laughs> Throw them under the bus. Anyways, uh, until next time, all hail the chair. See you Monday.